The Library of History by Diodorus Siculus, Book 18. Published in Volume 9 of the Loeb Classical Library Edition, 1947. Translated by Russell M. Gear. Digitalized by Bill Thayer. Audiobook produced by Open Audio Recordings and read by Nancy, a Microsoft Azure AI Neural Voice. Start of Book 18. Pythagoras of Samos and some others of the ancient philosophers declared that the souls of men are immortal and also that, in accordance with this doctrine, souls foreknow the future at that moment in death when they are departing from the bodies. It seems that the poet Homer agreed with them, for he introduced Hector at the time of his decease foretelling to Achilles the death that was soon to come upon him. Likewise, it is reported that even in more recent times what we have described above has happened in the case of many men as they were coming to the end of life, and in particular on the occasion of the death of Alexander of Macedon. When he was quitting life in Babylon and at his last breath was asked by his friends to whom he was leaving the kingdom, he said, to the best man, for I foresee that a great combat of my friends will be my funeral games. And this actually happened, for after the death of Alexander the foremost of his friends quarreled about the primacy and joined in many great combats. This book, which contains an account of the deeds accomplished by these friends, will make the philosopher's saying clear to the interested reader. The preceding book included all the acts of Alexander up to his death, this one, containing the deeds of those who succeeded to his kingdom, ends with the year before the tyranny of Agathocles and includes seven years. When Sophisodorus was archon at Athens, the Romans elected Lucius Furius and Decius Junius consuls. During this term, the throne was vacant, since Alexander the king had died without issue, and great contention arose over the leadership. The phalanx of the infantry was supporting Aridaeus, son of Philip, for the kingship, although he was afflicted with an incurable mental illness. The most influential of the friends and of the bodyguard, however, taking counsel together and joining to themselves the corps of horsemen known as the Companions, at first decided to take up arms against the phalanx and sent to the infantry envoys chosen from men of rank, of whom the most prominent was Meleager, demanding submission to their orders. Meleager, however, when he came to the men of the phalanx, made no mention of his mission but, on the contrary, praised them for the resolution that they had taken and sharpened their anger against their opponents. As a result, the Macedonians made Meleager their leader and advanced under arms against those who disagreed with them, but when the bodyguard had withdrawn from Babylon and was making ready for war, the men most inclined toward conciliation persuaded the parties to come to an agreement. Straightway they made Aridaeus, son of Philip, their king and changed his name to Philip, Perdiccas, to whom the king had given his ring as he died, they made regent of the kingdom, and they decided that the most important of the friends and of the bodyguard should take over the satrapies and obey the king and Perdiccas. After Perdiccas had assumed the supreme command and had taken counsel with the chief men, he gave Egypt to Ptolemy, son of Lagos, Syria to Laomedon of Mytilene, Cilicia to Philodas, and Media to Pithon. To you means he gave Paphlagonia and Cappadocia and all the lands bordering on these, which Alexander did not invade, having been prevented from doing so by the urgency of his affairs when he was finishing the war with Darius, to Antigonus he gave Pamphylia, Lycia, and what is called Great Phrygia, then to Asander, Curia, to Menander, Lydia, and to Leonidas, Hellespontine Phrygia. These satrapies, then, were distributed in that way. In Europe, Thrace and the neighboring tribes near the Pontic Sea were given to Lysimachus, and Macedonia and the adjacent peoples were assigned to Antipater. Perdiccas, however, decided not to disturb the remaining satrapies in Asia but to permit them to remain under the same rulers, likewise he determined that Taxiles and Porus should be masters of their own kingdoms as Alexander himself had arranged. To Pithon, he gave the satrapy next to Taxiles and the other kings, and the satrapy that lies along the Caucasus, called that of the Peroponicity, he assigned to Oxyarts the Bactrian, whose daughter Roxan Alexander had married. He gave Arachosia and Sidrosia to Sebertius, Arya and Drangian to Stasner of Soli, Bactrian and Sogdian to Philip, Parthia and Hyrcania to Fratiferns, Persia to Pusests, Carmania to Tlepolemus, Media to Atropates, Babylonia to Archon, and Mesopotamia to Arcesilus. He placed Seleucus in command of the cavalry of the Companions, a most distinguished office, for Hephaestion commanded them first, Perdiccas after him, and third the above-named Seleucus. The transportation of the body of the deceased king and the preparation of the vehicle that was to carry the body to Ammon they assigned to Aridaeus. 
It happened that Craterus, who was one of the most prominent men, had previously been sent away by Alexander to Cilicia with those men who had been discharged from the army, ten thousand in number. At the same time, he had received written instructions which the king had given him for execution. Nevertheless, after the death of Alexander, it seemed best to the successors not to carry out these plans. For when Perdic is found in the memoranda of the king orders for the completion of the pyre of Hephaestion, which required a great deal of money, and also for the other designs of Alexander, which were many and great and called for an unprecedented outlay, he decided that it was inexpedient to carry them out. But that he might not appear to be arbitrarily detracting anything from the glory of Alexander, he laid these matters before the common assembly of the Macedonians for consideration. The following were the largest and most remarkable items of the memoranda. It was proposed to build a thousand warships, larger than triremes, in Phoenicia, Syria, Cilicia, and Cyprus for the campaign against the Carthaginians and the others who live along the coast of Libya and Iberia and the adjoining coastal region as far as Sicily, to make a road along the coast of Libya as far as the pillars of Heracles and, as needed by so great an expedition, to construct ports and shipyards at suitable places, to erect six most costly temples, each at an expense of fifteen hundred talents, and, finally, to establish cities and to transplant populations from Asia to Europe and in the opposite direction from Europe to Asia, in order to bring the largest continents to common unity and to friendly kinship by means of intermarriages and family ties. The temples mentioned above were to be built at Delos, Delphi, and Dodona, and in Macedonia a temple to Zeus at Diam, to Artemis Teropolis at Amphipolis, and to Athena at Cernus. Likewise, at Ilium, in honor of this goddess, there was to be built a temple that could never be surpassed by any other. A tomb for his father Philip was to be constructed to match the greatest of the pyramids of Egypt, buildings which some persons count among the seven greatest works of man. When these memoranda had been read, the Macedonians, although they applauded the name of Alexander, nevertheless saw that the projects were extravagant and impracticable and decided to carry out none of those that have been mentioned. Perdiccas first put to death those soldiers who were fomenters of discord and most at enmity with himself, thirty in number. After that he also punished Meleager, who had been a traitor on the occasion of the contention and his mission, using as a pretext a private quarrel and a charge that Meleager was plotting against him. Then, since the Greeks who had been settled in the upper satrapies had revolted and raised an army of considerable size, he sent one of the nobles, Pithon, to fight it out with them. Considering the events that are to be narrated, I think it proper first to set forth the causes of the revolt, the situation of Asia as a whole, and the size and characteristics of the satrapies, for by placing before my readers' eyes the topography in general and the distances I shall best make the narrative easy for them to follow. Now from the Cilician Taurus a continuous range of mountains extends through the whole of Asia as far as the Caucasus and the Eastern Ocean. This range is divided by crests of varying heights, and each part has its proper name. Asia is thus separated into two parts, one sloping to the north, the other to the south. Corresponding to these slopes, the rivers flow in opposite directions. Of those on one side, some enter the Caspian Sea, some the Pontus Euxinus, and some the Northern Ocean. Of the rivers that lie opposite to these, some empty into the ocean that faces India, some into the ocean that is adjacent to this continent, and some flow into what is called the Red Sea. The satrapies likewise are divided, some sloping toward the north, the others toward the south. The first of those that face the north lie along the Tanais River, Sogdian and Bactrian, and next to these are Arya, Parthia, and Hyrcania, by which the Hyrcanian Sea, a detached body of water, is surrounded. Next is Media, which embraces many regions with distinctive names and is the greatest of all the satrapies. Armenia, Lycania, and Cappadocia, all having a very wintry climate, are next. Bordering on them in a straight line are both Great Phrygia and Hellespontine Phrygia, Lydia and Curia are to the side, above Phrygia and beside it is Pisidia, with Lycia next to it. In the coastal regions of these satrapies are established the cities of the Greeks, to give their names is not necessary for our present purposes. The satrapies that face the north are situated in the way described. Of those satrapies that face the south, the first one along the Caucasus is India, a great and populous kingdom, inhabited by many Indian nations, of which the greatest is that of the Gandharity, against whom Alexander did not make a campaign because of the multitude of their elephants. 
The river Ganges, which is the deepest of the region and has a width of 30 stades, separates this land from the neighboring part of India. Adjacent to this is the rest of India, which Alexander conquered, irrigated by water from the rivers and most conspicuous for its prosperity. Here were the dominions of Porus and Taxiles, together with many other kingdoms, and through it flows the Indus River, from which the country received its name. Next to the Indian satrapy Arachosia was marked off, and Sidrosia and Carmania, and Persia next to them, in which are Susan and Sidicine. Next comes Babylonia, extending to the Arabian Desert. On the other side, in the direction from which we make the march inland, is Mesopotamia encompassed by two rivers, the Euphrates and the Tigris, to which it owes its name. Next to Mesopotamia are Upper Syria, as it is called, and the countries adjacent thereto along the sea, Cilicia, Pamphylia, and Coel Syria, which encloses Phoenicia. Along the frontiers of Coel Syria and along the desert that lies next to it, through which the Nile makes its way and divides Syria and Egypt, the best satrapy of all and one that has the greatest revenues, was set up, Egypt. All these countries are very hot, since the air in the south is different from that which extends to the north. The satrapies, then, that were conquered by Alexander, are situated as described, and were distributed to the most noteworthy men. The Greeks who had been settled by Alexander in the upper satrapies, as they were called, although they longed for the Greek customs and manner of life and were cast away in the most distant part of the kingdom, yet submitted while the king was alive through fear, but when he was dead they rose in revolt. After they had taken counsel together and elected Philon the Enianian as general, they raised a considerable force. They had more than 20,000 foot soldiers and 3,000 horse, all of whom had many times been tried in the contests of war and were distinguished for their courage. When Perdiccas heard of the revolt of the Greeks, he drew by lot from the Macedonians 3,000 infantry and 800 horsemen. As commander of the whole he selected Pithon, who had been of the bodyguard of Alexander, a man full of spirit and able to command, and assigned to him the troops that had been drawn. After giving him letters for the satraps, in which it was written that they should furnish Pithon 10,000 footmen and 8,000 horsemen, he sent him against the rebels. Pithon, who was a man of great ambition, gladly accepted the expedition, intending to win the Greeks over through kindness, and, after making his army great through an alliance with them, to work in his own interests and become the ruler of the upper satrapies. But Perdiccas, suspecting his design, gave him definite orders to kill all the rebels when he had subdued them and to distribute the spoils to the soldiers. Pithon, setting out with the troops that had been given to him and receiving the auxiliaries from the satraps, came upon the rebels with all his forces. Through the agency of a certain Enianian he corrupted Lydodorus, who had been made a commander of three thousand among the rebels, and won a complete victory. For when the battle was begun and the victory was doubtful, the traitor left his allies without warning and withdrew to a certain hill, taking his three thousand men. The rest, believing that these were bent on flight, were thrown into confusion, turned about, and fled. Pithon, being victorious in the battle, sent a herald to the conquered, ordering them to lay down their arms and to return to their several colonies after receiving pledges. When oaths to this effect had been sworn and the Greeks were interspersed among the Macedonians, Pithon was greatly pleased, seeing that the affair was progressing according to his intentions, but the Macedonians, remembering the orders of Perdiccas and having no regard for the oaths that had been sworn, broke faith with the Greeks. Setting upon them unexpectedly and catching them off their guard, they shot them all down with javelins and seized their possessions as plunder. Pithon then, cheated of his hopes, came back with the Macedonians to Perdiccas. This was the state of affairs in Asia. In Europe, the Rhodians drove out their Macedonian garrison and freed their city, and the Athenians began what is called the Lamian War against Antipater. It is necessary to set forth the causes of this war in order that the events that took place in it may be made clearer. A short time before his death, Alexander decided to restore all the exiles in the Greek cities, partly for the sake of gaining fame, and partly wishing to secure many devoted personal followers in each city to counter the revolutionary movements and seditions of the Greeks. Therefore, the Olympic Games being at hand, he sent Nicanor of Stagira to Greece, giving him a decree about the restoration, which he ordered him to have proclaimed by the victorious herald to the crowds at the festival. Nicanor carried out his instructions, and the herald received and read the following message, King Alexander to the exiles from the Greek cities. 
We have not been the cause of your exile, but, save for those of you who are under a curse, we shall be the cause of your return to your own native cities. We have written to Antipater about this to the end, that if any cities are not willing to restore you, he may constrain them. When the herald had announced this, the crowd showed its approval with loud applause, for those at the festival welcomed the favor of the king with cries of joy, and repaid his good deed with praises. All the exiles had come together at the festival, being more than twenty thousand in number. Now people in general welcomed the restoration of the exiles as a good thing, but the Aetolians had exiled the Aeneadi from their native city and expected the punishment appropriate to their wrongdoing, for the king himself had threatened that no sons of the Aeneadi, but he himself, would punish them. Likewise, the Athenians, who had distributed Samos in allotments to their citizens, were by no means willing to abandon that island. Being no match, however, for the forces of the king, they remained quiet for the time being, waiting for a favorable opportunity, which fortune quickly gave them. When Alexander died a short time thereafter and left no sons as successors to the kingdom, the Athenians ventured to assert their liberty and to claim the leadership of the Greeks. As a resource for the war they had the sum of money left by Harpalus, the story of which we told in full in the preceding book, and likewise the mercenaries who, some eight thousand in number, had been dismissed from service by the satraps and were waiting near Tinarum in the Peloponnesus. They therefore gave secret instructions about these to Leosthenes the Athenian, ordering him at first to enroll them as if acting on his own responsibility without authority from the city, in order that Antipater, regarding Leosthenes with contempt, might be less energetic in his preparations, and the Athenians, on the other hand, might gain leisure and time for preparing some of the things necessary for the war. Accordingly, Leosthenes had very quietly hired the troops mentioned above and, contrary to general belief, had secured a considerable number of men ready for action, for these men, who had campaigned throughout Asia for a long time and had taken part in many great conflicts, had become masters of warfare. Now these things were being done while the death of Alexander was not yet certainly known, but when some came from Babylon who had been eyewitnesses of the king's death, then the popular government openly disclosed its intention of war and sent Leosthenes part of the money of Harpalus and many suits of armor, bidding him no longer act in secret but do openly whatever was advantageous. After Leosthenes had distributed their pay to the mercenaries and had fully armed those who lacked armor, he went to Aetolia to arrange for common action. When the Aetolians listened to him gladly and gave him seven thousand soldiers, he sent to the Locrians and the Phocians and the other neighboring peoples and urged them to assert their freedom and rid Greece of the Macedonian despotism. In the assembly at Athens, while the men of property were advising that no action be taken and the demagogues were rousing the people and urging them to prosecute the war vigorously, those who preferred war and were accustomed to make their living from paid military service were far superior in numbers. These were the men of whom Philip once said that war was peace and peace was war for them. Straightway, then, the orators gave shape to the wishes of the commons by writing a decree to the effect that the people should assume responsibility for the common freedom of the Greeks and liberate the cities that were subject to garrisons, that they should prepare forty quadriremes and two hundred triremes, that all Athenians up to the age of forty should be enrolled, that three tribes should guard Attica, and that the other seven should be ready for campaigns beyond the frontiers, that Envoys should be sent to visit the Greek cities and tell them that formerly the Athenian people, convinced that all Greece was the common fatherland of the Greeks, had fought by sea great those barbarians who had invaded Greece to enslave her, and that now too Athens believed it necessary to risk lives and money and ships in defense of the common safety of the Greeks. When this decree had been ratified more promptly than was wise, those of the Greeks who were superior in understanding said that the Athenian people had counseled well for glory but had missed what was expedient, for they had left the mark before the proper time and, with no necessity compelling them, were venturing to meet forces that were great and undefeated, and moreover, although they enjoyed a reputation for excelling in judgment, they had learned nothing even from the well-known. Misfortunes to Thebans Nevertheless, as the ambassadors made the circuit of the cities and roused them for war with their accustomed eloquence, most of the Greeks joined the alliance, some by national groups and some by cities. Of the rest of the Greeks, some were well disposed toward the Macedonians, others remained neutral. The Aetolians in full force were the first to join the alliance, as has been said, 
and after them all the Thessalians except those from Pelineum, the Aetians except the inhabitants of Heraclea, the Achaeans of Thyotis except the people of the bay, the Melians except those of Lamia, then in succession all the Dorians, the Locrians, and the Phocians, also the Aenianians, the Alasians, and the Delopians, and in addition the Athamanians, the Lucadians, and those of the Molossians who were subject to Arapteus. The last named, after making a hollow alliance, later treacherously cooperated with the Macedonians. Next, the Christians from Euboea undertook a share in the war, and finally, of the peoples of the Peloponnesus, the Argives, the Sicyonians, the Aleans, the Mycenaeans, and those who dwell on Act. Now those of the Greeks who joined the alliance were as I have listed them. Athens sent citizen soldiers to Leosthenes as reinforcements, 5,000 foot and 500 horse, and also 2,000 mercenaries. These were to go through Boeotia, but it happened that the Boeotians were hostile to the Athenians for some such reason as the following. After Alexander had raised Thebes, he had given the land to the neighboring Boeotians. They, having portioned out the property of the unfortunate people, were receiving a large income from the land. Therefore, since they knew that the Athenians, if they were successful in the war, would restore both fatherland and fields to the Thebans, they were inclined toward the Macedonians. While the Boeotians were encamped near Plataea, Leosthenes, taking part of his own forces, came into Boeotia. Drawing up his own men along with the Athenians against the inhabitants, he defeated the latter in battle and, after erecting a trophy, hurried back to Thermopylae. For there, where he had spent some time in occupying the passes in advance of the enemy, he intended to meet the Macedonian forces. When Antipater, who had been left by Alexander as general of Europe, heard of the death of the king in Babylon and of the distribution of the satrapies, he sent into Cilicia to Craterus, asking him to come to his aid as soon as possible, for the latter, having been previously dispatched to Cilicia, was going to bring back to Macedonia the Macedonians who had been mustered out of service being more than ten thousand in number. He also sent to Philodas, who had received Hellespontine Phrygia as his satrapy, asking him likewise for aid and promising him to give him one of his own daughters in marriage. As soon, however, as he learned of the movement concerted against him by the Greeks, he left Sippa as general of Macedonia, giving him a sufficient army and bidding him enlist as many men as possible, while he himself, taking 13,000 Macedonians and 600 horsemen, for Macedonia was short of citizen soldiers because of the number of those who had been sent to Asia as replacements for the army, set out from Macedonia to Thessaly, accompanied by the entire fleet which Alexander had sent to convoy a sum of money from the royal treasury to Macedonia, being in all 110 triremes. At first the Thessalians were allies of Antipater and sent out to him many good horsemen, but later, won over by the Athenians, they rode off to Leosthenes and, arrayed with the Athenians, fought for the liberty of the Greeks. Now that this great force had been added to the Athenians, the Greeks, who far outnumbered the Macedonians, were successful. Antipater was defeated in battle, and subsequently, since he neither dared to engage in battle nor was able to return in safety to Macedonia, he took refuge in Lamia. He kept his troops in the city and strengthened its walls, besides preparing arms, engines, and food, while anxiously waiting for his allies from Asia. Leosthenes, when he had come near Lamia with all his forces, fortified a camp with a deep ditch and a palisade. At first, he would draw up his forces, approach the city, and challenge the Macedonians to battle, then, as the latter did not dare risk an encounter, he made daily attacks on the walls with relays of soldiers. As the Macedonians defended themselves stoutly, many of the Greeks who pushed on rashly were killed, for the besieged, since there was a considerable force in the city and an abundance of all sorts of missiles, and the wall, moreover, had been constructed at great expense, easily had the better of the fighting. Leosthenes, giving up hope of capturing the city by storm, shut off all the supplies that were going into it, thinking that he would easily reduce by hunger the forces besieged in the city. He also built a wall and dug a deep, wide ditch, thereby cutting off all escape for the beleaguered troops. After this, the Aetolians all returned to Aetolia, having asked Leosthenes for permission to go home for the present because of some national business. Antipater and his men, however, were nearly exhausted and the city was in danger of being taken because of the anticipated famine when chance gave the Macedonians an unexpected turn of good fortune. 
for when Antipater made an attack on the men who were digging the moat and a struggle ensued, Leosthenes, coming to aid his men, was struck on the head by a stone and at once fell and was carried to camp in a swoon. On the third day he died and was buried with the honors of a hero because of the glory he had gained in war. The Athenian people caused the funeral oration to be delivered by Hyperiades, foremost of the orators, in eloquence and in hostility toward the Macedonians, for at that time Demosthenes, the chief of the orators of Athens, was in exile, convicted of having taken some of the money of Harpalus. In place of Leosthenes, Antiphilus was made general, a man outstanding in military genius and courage. Such was the situation in Europe. In Asia, of those who had shared in the division of the satrapies, Ptolemy took over Egypt without difficulty and was treating the inhabitants with kindness. Finding 8,000 talents in the treasury, he began to collect mercenaries and to form an army. A multitude of friends also gathered about him on account of his fairness. With Antipater, he carried on a diplomatic correspondence that led to a treaty of cooperation, since he well knew that Perdiccas would attempt to wrest from him the satrapy of Egypt. Lysimachus, when he entered the Thracian region and found that the king of that country, Suths, had taken the field with 20,000 infantry and 8,000 cavalry, was not frightened by the size of the army. And although he had in all no more than 4,000 foot soldiers and only 2,000 horsemen, he joined battle with the barbarians. In truth, he was superior to them in the quality of his troops, though inferior in numbers, and the battle was a stubborn one. After losing most of his own men but killing many times that number, he returned to his camp with but a doubtful claim to victory. Therefore, for the moment, the forces of both sides withdrew from the locality and busied themselves with greater preparations for the final conflict. As for Leonidas, when Hecateus came to him as envoy and begged him to aid Antipater and the Macedonians with all speed, he promised to give military aid. He crossed over, therefore, into Europe and went on to Macedonia, where he enlisted many additional Macedonian soldiers. When he had gathered together in all more than 20,000 infantry and 1,500 cavalry, he led them through Thessaly against the enemy. The Greeks, giving up the siege and burning their camp, sent away to the town of Militia the camp followers, who were useless in a pitched battle and the baggage train, while they themselves went forward with light equipment and ready for battle in order to engage the forces of Leonidas before Antipater joined them and both armies came together in one place. They had in all 22,000 foot soldiers, for all the Aetolians had previously departed to their own country and not a few of the other Greeks had at that time scattered to their native states. More than 3,500 horsemen took part in the campaign, 2,000 being Thessalians exceptional for their courage. In these, especially, the Greeks trusted for victory. Now when a fierce cavalry battle had gone on for some time and the Thessalians, thanks to their valor, were gaining the upper hand, Leonidas, after fighting brilliantly even when cut off in a swampy place, was worsted at every point. Stricken with many wounds and at the point of death, he was taken up by his followers and carried, already dead, to the baggage train. The cavalry battle having been gloriously won by the Greeks under the command of Menon the Thessalian, the Macedonian phalanx, for fear of the cavalry, at once withdrew from the plain to the difficult terrain above and gained safety for themselves by the strength of the position. When the Thessalian cavalry, which continued to attack, was unable to accomplish anything because of the rough ground, the Greeks, who had set up a trophy and gained control of the dead, left the field of battle. On the next day, however, when Antipater came up with his troops and joined the defeated, all the Macedonians united in a single camp and Antipater took command of the whole. He decided to avoid fighting for the present and, in view of the fact that the enemy were superior in cavalry, determined not to retreat through the plain. Instead, by going through the rough country and seizing in advance any points of vantage, he made good his retreat from the region. Antiphilus, the Greek commander, having defeated the Macedonians in a glorious battle, played a waiting game, remaining in Thessaly and watching for the enemy to move. The affairs of the Greeks were thus in thriving condition, but since the Macedonians had command of the sea, the Athenians made ready other ships in addition to those which they already had, so that there were in all 170. Clytus was in command of the Macedonian fleet, which numbered 240. Engaging with the Athenian admiral Evetian, he defeated him in two naval battles and destroyed a large number of the ships of the enemy near the islands that are called the Echinades. While these things were going on, Perdiccas, taking with him King Philip and the royal army, campaigned against Ariarades, the ruler of Cappadocia. 
his failure to take orders from the Macedonians had been overlooked by Alexander owing to the struggle with Darius and its distractions and he had enjoyed a very long respite as king of Cappadocia. As a result, he had amassed a great sum of money from the revenues and had formed a large body of native troops and mercenaries. He was thus ready to enter the lists against Perdiccas in defense of his kingdom with 30,000 infantry and 15,000 cavalry. Perdiccas joined battle with him and, defeating him in the conflict, slew men to the number of 4,000 and took captive more than 5,000, among them Ariarades himself. Now the king and all his relatives Perdiccas tortured and impaled, but to the conquered people he granted immunity, and after putting in order the affairs of Cappadocia, he gave the satrapy to Eumenes of Cardia, just as it had originally been assigned. About the same time Craterus also departed from Cilicia and arrived in Macedonia to reinforce Antipater and to make good the defeats that the Macedonians had suffered. He brought with him 6,000 foot soldiers from those who had crossed into Asia with Alexander and 4,000 from those who had been enlisted on the march, 1,000 Persian bowmen and slingers, and 1,500 horsemen. Entering Thessaly and freely yielding the chief command to Antipater, he shared a camp with him beside the Peneus River. Including those who had been under Leonidas, there were gathered together in all more than 40,000 heavy armed infantry, 3,000 bowmen and slingers, and 5,000 cavalry. The Greeks who were encamped against them at this time were far inferior in numbers, for many of them, despising the enemy because of their former good fortune, had gone away to their own cities to look after their private affairs. Since many soldiers were absent from duty for this reason, there remained in camp only 25,000 foot soldiers and 3,500 cavalry. They placed their chief hope of victory in the latter, because the men were brave and the ground was level. At last Antipater began to draw up his forces each day and challenge the Greeks to battle. For a while, these waited for their men to return from their cities, but since time was pressing, they were forced to come out and stake all. They drew up their lines, placing the cavalry in front of the phalanx of infantry since they were eager to decide the battle by means of this arm. When the cavalry had met in battle and the Thessalian horsemen were getting the advantage because of their valor, Antipater led out his own phalanx and, rushing upon the infantry of the enemy, began to make great slaughter. The Greeks, since they were not able to withstand the weight and number of the enemy, immediately withdrew to the rough ground, carefully keeping their ranks. Thus they occupied the higher ground and easily repulsed the Macedonians thanks to their possession of the superior position. Although the Greek cavalry had gained the advantage, as soon as the horsemen learned of the withdrawal of the infantry, they at once retired toward them. Then, after such a combat as I have described, the battle was broken off, as the scales of victory swung in favor of the Macedonians. More than 500 of the Greeks were killed in the battle and 130 of the Macedonians. On the next day Menon and Antiphilus, the leaders of the Greeks, came together and took counsel whether they should wait for the allies from the cities and then, when they were in position to fight on equal terms, seek a final decision, or, yielding to the present situation, should send envoys to seek a truce. They decided to dispatch heralds to treat for peace. These carried out their orders, but Antipater answered that the cities must negotiate separately, for he would by no means make a mass settlement. Since the Greeks refused to agree to peace terms city by city, Antipater and Craterus began to lay siege to the cities in Thessaly and to take them by storm, since the Greeks could not send aid to them. When the cities were thus badly frightened and each on its own account began to send envoys about a settlement, Antipater came to terms with all of them, granting them peace on easy terms. This resulted in a movement among the cities to secure their safety separately and all quickly obtained terms of peace, but those who were most hostile to the Macedonians, the Aetolians and the Athenians, deserted by their allies, took counsel about the war with their own generals. Antipater, after he had destroyed the alliance of the Greeks by this device, led all his forces against the Athenians. The people, bereft of the aid of their allies, were in great perplexity. All turned to Demades and shouted that he must be sent as envoy to Antipater to sue for peace, but, although he was called on by name to give advice, he did not respond. He had been convicted three times of introducing illegal decrees, and for this reason he had been deprived of his rights as a citizen and was prevented by the laws from advising, yet, on being restored to full rights by the possible, he was at once sent as envoy along with Phocian and some others. 
When Antipater had heard what they had to say, he made answer that he would end the war against the Athenians on no other condition than that they surrender all their interests to his discretion, for, after they had shut Antipater up in Lamia, they had made that same reply to him when he had sent envoys about peace. The people, not being in position to fight, were forced to grant to Antipater such discretion and complete authority over the city. He dealt humanely with them and permitted them to retain their city and their possessions and everything else, but he changed the government from a democracy, ordering that political power should depend on a census of wealth, and that those possessing more than 2,000 drachmas should be in control of the government and of the elections. He removed from the body of citizens all who possessed less than this amount on the ground that they were disturbers of the peace and warmongers, offering to those who wished it a place for settlement in Thrace. These men, more than twelve thousand in number, were removed from their fatherland, but those who possessed the stated rating, being about nine thousand, were designated as masters of both city and territory and conducted the government according to the constitution of Solon. All were permitted to keep their property uncurtailed. They were, however, forced to receive a garrison with Manilis as its commander, its purpose being to prevent anyone from undertaking changes in the government. The decision in regard to Samos was referred to the kings. The Athenians, being thus humanely treated beyond their hopes, secured peace, and, since henceforth they conducted their public affairs without disturbance and enjoyed the produce of the land unmolested, they quickly made great progress in wealth. When Antipater had returned to Macedonia, he presented Craterus with suitable honors and gifts, giving him also his eldest daughter Philadelphia in marriage, and helped him to prepare for his return to Asia. He likewise showed moderation in dealing with the other Greek cities, both reducing their citizen bodies and wisely reforming them, for which he received eulogies and crowns. Perdiccas, restoring their city and territory to the Samians, brought them back to their fatherland after they had been exiles for forty-three years. Now that we have narrated all the actions in the course of the Lamian War, we shall turn to the war that took place in Cyrene, so that the course of our history may not deviate too much from the chronological sequence. But it is necessary to go back a little in time in order to make clearer the several series of events. When Harpalus had fled from Asia and sailed to Crete with the mercenaries, as we have shown in the preceding book, Thybron, who was regarded as one of his friends, treacherously murdered him and gained control of the money and the soldiers, who numbered seven thousand. He also took possession of the ships, embarked the soldiers on them, and sailed to the land of the Cyrenians. He had taken with him the exiles from Cyrene and was using them as instructors in his project because of their knowledge of the locality. When the Cyrenians opposed him and a battle took place, Thybron was victorious, killing many and taking captive no small number. By gaining control of the harbor and besieging and frightening the Cyrenians, he forced them to come to terms and to agree to give him five hundred talents of silver and to contribute half of their chariots to aid his campaign. He sent envoys, moreover, to the other cities, asking them to make an alliance on the ground that he was going to subdue the neighboring parts of Libya. He also treated as spoil the property of the traders that had been captured in the port and gave it to his soldiers as plunder, calling forth their zeal for the war. Although the affairs of Thybron were thus prospering, fortune by a sudden shift humbled him through the following circumstances. One of his leaders, a Cretan by birth, whose name was Nasicles, a man of experience in warfare, quarreled with him, having complained about the distribution of the booty, and being contentious by nature and bold, he deserted to the Cyrenians. Moreover, he made many complaints against Thybron, charging him with cruelty and faithlessness, and persuaded the Cyrenians to break the treaty and make a bid for liberty. And so when sixty talents only had been paid, and the rest of the money was not being given, Thybron denounced the rebels, seized any Cyrenians who were in the port, some eighty in number, and then, leading his forces directly against the city, laid siege to it. As he was unable to accomplish anything, he returned to the port. Since the people of Barca and of Hesperus were allied with Thybron, the Cyrenians, leaving part of their forces in Cyrene, took the field with part and plundered the land of their neighbors. When these called on Thybron to give them aid, he led all his soldiers against the alliance. At this the Cretan, concluding that the harbor was deserted, persuaded those who were left in Cyrene to attack it. When they obeyed him, he at once made an attack on the port, leading the way himself, and, easily gaining control of it thanks to the absence of Thybron, he restored to the merchants what was left of the cargoes and zealously guarded the port. 
At first Thybrin was disheartened, since he had lost an advantageous position and the equipment of his soldiers, but afterwards, when he had recovered his spirits and captured by siege the city called Tachira, his hopes again rose. It chanced, however, that in a short time he again encountered great misfortunes. The crews of his ships, having been deprived of their harbor and resulting short of food, were accustomed each day to go out into the country and gather supplies there, but the Libyans ambushed them as they were wandering about the country, killed many, and took no small number captive. Those who escaped the danger fled to the ships and sailed away for the allied cities. But when a great storm overtook them, most of the ships were swallowed by the sea, of the rest, some were cast ashore in Cyprus, others in Egypt. Nevertheless Thybrin, although he had encountered such a misfortune, did not give up the campaign. Selecting those of his friends who were fitted for the task, he sent them to the Peloponnesus to hire those of the mercenaries who were waiting about near Tinarum, for many of the discharged mercenaries were still roaming about seeking paymasters, and at that time there were more than 2,500 of them at Tinarum. His messengers engaged these and set out upon the voyage to Cyrene. But before their arrival the Cyrenians, encouraged by their successes, joined battle and defeated Thybrin, killing many of his soldiers. But when, on account of these failures, Thybrin was now ready to abandon the operations against Cyrene, he unexpectedly regained courage, for as soon as the soldiers from Tinarum put into port and a large force was added to his strength, he became confident in spirit. As the Cyrenians saw the tide of war again rising, they summoned the allied forces from the neighboring Libyans and from the Carthaginians, and having collected in all 30,000 men including their citizen soldiers, they made ready to reach a final decision in battle. When a great battle had taken place, Thybrin, having won the victory with great slaughter of the enemy, was overjoyed, believing that he would at once capture the adjacent cities, but the Cyrenians, whose commanders had all been killed in the battle, elected the Cretan Nasicles general along with others. Thybrin, elated by the victory, laid siege to the port of the Cyrenians and made daily assaults on Cyrene. As the war continued a long time, the Cyrenians, who were in want of food, quarreled among themselves, and the commons, gaining the upper hand, drove out the rich, who, bereft of their fatherland, fled, some to Thybrin, others to Egypt. The latter, after persuading Ptolemy to restore them, returned bringing with them a considerable force, both infantry and naval, with Ophelas as general. The exiles who were with Thybrin, hearing of the approach of these men and attempting to go over to them secretly at night, were detected and cut down to a man. The democratic leaders of Cyrene, becoming alarmed at the return of the exiles, made terms with Thybrin and prepared to fight against Ophelas in common with him, but Ophelas, after defeating and capturing Thybrin and also gaining control of the cities, delivered both the cities and the country over the Ptolemy the king. Thus the Cyrenians and the surrounding cities lost their freedom and were annexed to the kingdom of Ptolemy. Now when Perdiccas and King Philip had defeated Ariarades and delivered his satrapy to Eumenes, they departed from Cappadocia. And having arrived in Pisidia, they determined to lay waste two cities, that of the Lorandians and that of the Isaurians, for while Alexander was still alive these cities had put to death Balacrus the son of Nicanor, who had been appointed general and satrap. Now the city of the Lorandians they took by assault, and after killing the men of fighting age and enslaving the rest of the population, raised it to the ground. The city of the Isaurians, however, was strongly fortified and large and moreover was filled with stout warriors, so when they had besieged it vigorously for two days and had lost many of their own men, they withdrew, for the inhabitants, who were well provided with missiles and other things needed for withstanding a siege and were enduring the dreadful ordeal with desperate courage in their hearts were readily giving their lives to preserve their freedom. On the third day, when many had been slain and the walls had few defenders because of the lack of men, the citizens performed a heroic and memorable deed. Seeing that the punishment that hung over them could not be averted, and not having a force that would be adequate to stave the enemy off, they determined not to surrender the city and place their fate in the hands of the enemy, since in that way their punishment combined with outrage was certain, but at night all with one accord, seeking the noble kind of death, shut up their children, wives, and parents in their houses, and set the houses on fire, choosing by means of the fire a common death. And burial. As the blaze suddenly flared aloft, the Isaurians cast into the fire their goods and everything that could be of use to the victors, Perdiccas and his officers, astounded at what was taking place, stationed their troops about the city and made a strong effort to break into the city on all sides. 
when now the inhabitants defended themselves from the walls and struck down many of the Macedonians, Perdiccas was even more astonished and sought the reason why men who had given their homes and all else to the flames should be so intent upon defending the walls. Finally Perdiccas and the Macedonians withdrew from the city, and the Isaurians, throwing themselves into the fire, found burial in their homes along with their families. When the night was over, Perdiccas gave the city to his soldiers for booty. They, when they had put out the fire, found an abundance of silver and gold, as was natural in a city that had been prosperous for a great many years. After the destruction of the cities there came two women to marry Perdiccas, Nicaea, the daughter of Antipater, for whose hand Perdiccas himself had sued, and Cleopatra, who was Alexander's own sister, daughter of Philip son of Amintas. Perdiccas had formerly planned to work in harmony with Antipater, and for this reason he had pressed his suit when his position was not yet firmly established, but when he had gained control of the royal armies and the guardianship of the kings, he changed his calculations. For since he was now reaching out for the kingship, he was bent upon marrying Cleopatra, believing that he could use her to persuade the Macedonians to help him gain the supreme power. But not wishing as yet to reveal his design, he married Nicaea for the time, so that he might not render Antipater hostile to his own undertakings. Presently, however, Antigonus learned his intentions, and since Antigonus was a friend of Antipater and, moreover, the most energetic of the commanders, Perdiccas decided to put him out of the way. So, by bringing false slanders and unjust charges against him, he clearly revealed his intention of destroying him. Antigonus, however, who excelled in keenness and daring, outwardly let it be known that he wished to defend himself against these charges, but secretly he made arrangements for flight and, with his personal friends and his son Demetrius, boarded the Athenian ships unexpectedly at night. And having been brought to Europe in these, he travelled on to join forces with Antipater. At this time Antipater and Craterus had taken the field against the Aetolians with 30,000 infantry and 2,500 cavalry, for of those who had taken part in the Lamian War, the Aetolians alone were left unconquered. Although such great forces were sent against them, they were in no panic-stricken mood, but gathering together all who were in the full vigor of manhood to the number of 10,000, they retired to the mountainous and rough places, in which they placed the children, the women, and the old, together with the greater part of their wealth. The cities that could not be defended they abandoned, but those that were particularly strong they secured, each with a considerable garrison, and boldly awaited the approach of the enemy. Antipater and Craterus, coming into Aetolia and finding that the cities which were easy to capture were deserted, moved against the men who had withdrawn into the difficult regions. At first, then, the Macedonians, violently attacking positions that were strongly fortified and in broken terrain, lost many of their soldiers, for the hardihood of the Aetolians joined with the strength of their positions easily turned back men who rushed headlong into dangers beyond reach of succor. Afterward, however, when Craterus had built shelters and was forcing the enemy to stay through the winter and to hold out in regions that were covered with snow and lacking in food, the Aetolians were brought into the greatest dangers, for they had either to come down from their mountains and fight against forces numbering many times their own and against famous generals, or to remain and be utterly destroyed by want and cold. When they were already giving up hope of salvation, relief from their troubles appeared of its own accord, just as if one of the gods had been moved to pity by their high courage. For Antigonus, he who had fled from Asia, joined Antipater and told him the whole plot of Perdiccas, and that Perdiccas, after marrying Cleopatra, would come at once with his army to Macedonia as king and deprive Antipater of the supreme command. Craterus and Antipater, dumbfounded by the unexpected news, met in council with their commanders. When the situation had been presented for deliberation, it was unanimously decided to make peace with the Aetolians on whatever terms were possible, to transport the armies with all speed to Asia, to assign the command of Asia to Craterus and that of Europe to Antipater, and also to send an embassy to Ptolemy to discuss concerted action, since he was utterly hostile to Perdiccas but friendly to them, and he in common with them was an object of the plot. Therefore they at once made a treaty with the Aetolians, firmly resolved to conquer them later and to move them all, men, women, and children, to the most distant desert of Asia. When they had recorded a decree embodying these plans, they made preparations for the campaign. Perdiccas, gathering his friends and generals, referred to them for consideration the question whether it was better to march against Macedonia or first to take the field against Ptolemy. 
when all favored defeating Ptolemy I in order that there might be no obstacle in the way of their Macedonian campaign, he sent Eumenes off with a considerable army, ordering him to watch over the region of the Hellespont and prevent a crossing, and he himself, taking the army from Pisidia, proceeded against Egypt. Such, then, were the events of this year when Philicles was archon in Athens, Gaius Sulpicius and Gaius Elias were elected consuls in Rome. In this year Aridaeus, who had been placed in charge of bringing home the body of Alexander, having completed the vehicle on which the royal body was to be carried, was making preparations for the journey. Since the structure that had been made ready, being worthy of the glory of Alexander, not only surpassed all others in cost, it had been constructed at the expense of many talents, but was also famous for the excellence of its workmanship, I believe that it is well to describe it. First they prepared a coffin of the proper size for the body, made of hammered gold, and the space about the body they filled with spices such as could make the body sweet-smelling and incorruptible. Upon this chest there had been placed a cover of gold, matching it to a nicety, and fitting about its upper rim. Over this was laid a magnificent purple robe embroidered with gold, beside which they placed the arms of the deceased, wishing the design of the whole to be in harmony with his accomplishments. Then they set up next to it the covered carriage that was to carry it. At the top of the carriage was built a vault of gold, eight cubits wide and twelve long, covered with overlapping scales set with precious stones. Beneath the roof all along the work was a rectangular cornice of gold, from which projected heads of goat stags in high relief. Gold rings two palms broad were suspended from these, and through the rings there ran a festive garland beautifully decorated in bright colors of all kinds. At the ends there were tassels of network suspending large bells, so that any who were approaching heard the sound from a great distance. On each corner of the vault on each side was a golden figure of victory holding a trophy. The colonnade that supported the vault was of gold with ionic capitals. Within the colonnade was a golden net, made of cords the thickness of a finger, which carried four long painted tablets, their ends adjoining, each equal in length to a side of the colonnade. On the first of these tablets was a chariot ornamented with work in relief, and sitting in it was Alexander holding a very splendid scepter in his hands. About the king were groups of armed attendants, one of Macedonians, a second of Persians of the bodyguard, and armed soldiers in front of them. The second tablet showed the elephants arrayed for war who followed the bodyguard. They carried Indian mahouts in front with Macedonians fully armed in their regular equipment behind them. The third tablet showed troops of cavalry as if in formation for battle, and the fourth, ships made ready for naval combat. Beside the entrance to the chamber there were golden lions with eyes turned toward those who would enter. There was a golden acanthus stretching little by little up the center of each column from below to the capital. Above the chamber in the middle of the top under the open sky there was a purple banner blazoned with a golden olive wreath of great size, and when the sun cast upon it its rays, it sent forth such a bright and vibrant gleam that from a great distance it appeared like a flash of lightning. The body of the chariot beneath the covered chamber had two axles upon which turned four Persian wheels, the naves and spokes of which were gilded, but the part that bore upon the ground was of iron. The projecting parts of the axle were made of gold in the form of lion heads, each holding a spear in its teeth. Along the middle of their length the axles had a bearing ingeniously fitted to the middle of the chamber in such a way that, thanks to it, the chamber could remain undisturbed by shocks from rough places. There were four poles, and to each of them were fastened four teams with four mules harnessed in each team, so that in all there were sixty-four mules, selected for their strength and size. Each of them was crowned with a gilded crown, each had a golden bell hanging by either cheek, and about their necks were collars set with precious stones. In this way the carriage was constructed and ornamented, and it appeared more magnificent when seen than when described. Because of its widespread fame it drew together many spectators, for from every city into which it came the whole people went forth to meet it and again escorted it on its way out, not becoming sated with the pleasure of beholding it. To correspond to this magnificence, it was accompanied by a crowd of roadmenders and mechanics, and also by soldiers sent to escort it. When Aridaeus had spent nearly two years in making ready this work, he brought the body of the king from Babylon to Egypt. Ptolemy, moreover, doing honor to Alexander, went to meet it with an army as far as Syria, and, receiving the body, deemed it worthy of the greatest consideration. He decided for the present not to send it to Ammon, but to entomb it in the city that had been founded by Alexander himself, 
which lacked little of being the most renowned of the cities of the inhabited earth. There he prepared a precinct worthy the glory of Alexander in size and construction. Entombing him in this and honoring him with sacrifices such as are paid to demigods and with magnificent games, he won fair requital not only from men but also from the gods. For men, because of his graciousness and nobility of heart, came together eagerly from all sides to Alexandria and gladly enrolled for the campaign, although the army of the kings was about to fight against that of Ptolemy, and, even though the risks were manifest and great, yet all of them willingly took upon themselves at their personal risk the preservation of Ptolemy's safety. The gods also saved him unexpectedly from the greatest dangers on account of his courage and his honest treatment of all his friends. For Perdiccas, viewing with suspicion Ptolemy's increase in power, decided that he himself and the kings would make a campaign against Egypt with most of the army, but you means he sent to the Hellespont to prevent Antipater and Craterus from crossing into Asia, giving him a suitable force. He also sent with him enough of the commanders of note, of whom the most prominent were his brother Alcides and Neoptolemus, and he ordered them to obey you means in all things because of his skill as general and his firm loyalty. Eumenes, with the forces that had been given him, went to the Hellespont, and there, having already prepared a large body of cavalry from his own satrapy, he marshaled his army, which had previously been deficient in that branch. When Craterus and Antipater had brought their forces across from Europe, Neoptolemus, who was jealous of Eumenes and had a considerable number of Macedonians in his following, secretly entered into negotiations with Antipater, came to an agreement with him, and plotted against Eumenes. On being discovered and forced to fight, he himself was in danger of being killed, and he lost almost all his forces, for you means, after he had won the victory and had killed many, won over the remaining soldiers and increased his own power, not only by the victory but also by having acquired a large number of stout Macedonians. But Neoptolemus, who had saved himself from the battle with three hundred horsemen, rode off with them to Antipater. A council of war was held, and it was decided to divide the forces into two parts. Antipater was to take one part and set out for Cilicia to fight against Perdiccas, and Craterus with the other part was to attack Eumenes and, after defeating him, to join Antipater. In this way, when they had combined their forces and had added Ptolemy to the alliance, they might be able to overmatch the royal armies. As soon as Eumenes heard that the enemy was advancing upon him, he collected his forces, particularly his cavalry, from all sides. Since he could not equal the Macedonian phalanx with his foot soldiers, he made ready a noteworthy corps of horsemen, by means of whom he hoped to defeat those opposed to him. When the forces were near each other, Craterus summoned the whole army to an assembly and spurred them to battle with suitable words, saying that, if the soldiers were victorious in battle, he would give them all the baggage of the enemy to plunder. Now that all had become eager for battle, he drew up the army, taking command of the right wing himself, and giving the command of the left to Neoptolemus. He had in all twenty thousand foot soldiers, chiefly Macedonians famed for their courage, on whom in particular he placed his hopes of victory, and more than two thousand horsemen as auxiliaries. Eumenes had twenty thousand foot soldiers, men of every race, and five thousand cavalry, by whom he had resolved to decide the encounter. After both leaders had disposed their cavalry on the wings and had ridden far in advance of the line of infantry, Craterus was the first to charge upon the enemy with his picked troops, and he fought admirably, but his horse stumbled, and he fell to the ground, where he was trampled underfoot and ended his life ingloriously, unrecognized in the confusion and dense array of the charge. By his death the enemy were so encouraged that they rushed upon the mass from every side, and great slaughter ensued. The right wing, crushed in this way, was compelled to flee to the phalanx of the foot soldiers, overwhelmingly defeated. On the left wing, however, where Neoptolemus was arrayed against Eumenes himself, there occurred a great display of ambitious rivalry as the leaders rushed full at each other. For as soon as they recognized one another by their horses and other insignia, they engaged each other in close combat, and they made the victory depend upon the duel between themselves. After the opening exchange of sword strokes they engaged in a strange and most extraordinary duel, for, carried away by their anger and their mutual hatred, they let the reins fall from their left hands and grappled each other. As a result of this, their horses were carried out from under them by their own momentum and the men themselves fell to the ground. Although it was difficult for either of them to get up because of the suddenness and force of the fall, especially as the armor hampered their bodies, Eumenes rose up first and forestalled Neoptolemus by striking him in the back of the knee. 
Since the gash proved to be severe and his legs gave way, the stricken man lay disabled, prevented by his wound from rising to his feet. Yet his courage overcame the weakness of his body, and, resting on his knees, he wounded his opponent with three blows on the arm and the thighs. As none of these blows was fatal and the wounds were still fresh, Yumin struck Neoptolemus in the neck with a second blow and slew him. Meanwhile, the rest of the cavalry had joined battle and were making great slaughter. So, while some fell and others were wounded, the battle at first was even, but afterwards, when they became aware of the death of Neoptolemus and of the rout of the other wing, all made off and fled for refuge to the phalanx of their infantry as to a strong fortress. You means, satisfied with his advantage and master of the bodies of both generals, recalled his soldiers with the sound of the trumpet. After he had set up a trophy and buried the dead, he sent to the phalanx of the vanquished, inviting them to unite with him and giving permission to them severally to withdraw to whatever places they wished. When the Macedonians had accepted the terms of surrender and had pledged their faith by oaths, they received permission to go for food to certain villages that lay near. And they deceived Eumenes, for when they had recovered their strength and collected supplies, they set out at night and went off secretly to join Antipater. Eumenes attempted to punish the faithlessness of these men who had broken their oath and to follow at the heels of the phalanx, but, owing to the hardihood of those who were retreating and to the weakness caused by his wounds, he was unable to accomplish anything and gave up the pursuit. So by winning a notable victory and by slaying two mighty leaders, Eumenes gained great glory. As soon as Antipater had received and enrolled those who escaped from the rout, he went on to Cilicia, making haste to go to the aid of Ptolemy. And Perdiccas, on learning of the victory of Eumenes, became much more confident in regard to the Egyptian campaign, and when he approached the Nile, he camped not far from the city of Pelusium. But when he undertook to clear out an old canal, and the river broke out violently and destroyed his work, many of his friends deserted him and went over to Ptolemy. Perdiccas, indeed, was a man of blood, one who usurped the authority of the other commanders and, in general, wished to rule all by force, but Ptolemy, on the contrary, was generous and fair and granted to all the commanders the right to speak frankly. What is more, he had secured all the most important points in Egypt with garrisons of considerable size, which had been well equipped with every kind of missile as well as with everything else. This explains why he had, as a rule, the advantage in his undertakings, since he had many persons who were well disposed to him and ready to undergo danger gladly for his sake. Still Perdiccas, in an effort to correct his deficiencies, called the commanders together, and by gifts to some, by great promises to others, and by friendly intercourse with all, won them over to his service and inspired them to meet the coming dangers. After warning them to be ready to break camp, he set out with his army at evening, disclosing to no one the point to which he intended to go. After marching all night at top speed, he made camp beside the Nile near a certain fortified post that is called the Fort of Camels. And as day was dawning, he began to send the army across, the elephants in the van, then following them the shield-bearers and the ladder-carriers, and others whom he expected to use in the attack on the fort. Last of all came the bravest of the cavalry, whom he planned to send against the troops of Ptolemy if they happened to appear. When they were halfway over, Ptolemy and his troops did appear, coming at a run to the defense of the post. Although these got the start of the attackers, threw themselves into the fort, and made their arrival known by blasts of the trumpet and by shouts, the troops of Perdiccas were not frightened, but boldly assaulted the fortifications. At once the shield-bearers set up the scaling ladders and began to mount them, while the elephant-borne troops were tearing the palisades to pieces and throwing down the parapets. Ptolemy, however, who had the best soldiers near himself and wished to encourage the other commanders and friends to face the dangers, taking his long spear and posting himself on the top of the outwork, put out the eyes of the leading elephant, since he occupied a higher position, and wounded its Indian Mahout. Then, with utter contempt of the danger, striking and disabling those who were coming up the ladders, he sent them rolling down, in their armor, into the river. Following his example, his friends fought boldly and made the beast next in line entirely useless by shooting down the Indian who was directing it. The battle for the wall lasted a long time, as the troops of Perdiccas, attacking in relays, bent every effort to take the stronghold by storm, while many heroic conflicts were occasioned by the personal prowess of Ptolemy and by his exhortations to his friends to display both their loyalty and their courage. 
Many men were killed on both sides, such was the surpassing rivalry of the commanders, the soldiers of Ptolemy having the advantage of the higher ground and those of Perdiccas being superior in number. Finally, when both sides had spent the whole day in the engagement, Perdiccas gave up the siege and went back to his own camp. Breaking camp at night, he marched secretly and came to the place that lies opposite Memphis, where it happens that the Nile is divided and makes an island large enough to hold with safety a camp of a very large army. To this island he began to transfer his men, the soldiers crossing with difficulty because of the depth of the river, for the water, which came up to the chins of those who were crossing, buffeted their bodies, especially as they were impeded by their equipment. But Perdiccas, seeing the difficulty caused by the current, in an effort to break the downward rush of the river, placed the elephants in line on the left, thus mitigating the strength of the current, and placed on the right side the horsemen, through whose agency he kept catching the men who were being carried away by the river and bringing them safe to the other side. A peculiar and surprising thing took place during the crossing of this army, namely, that after the first men had crossed in safety, those who tried to cross afterwards fell into great danger. For although there was no visible cause, the river became much deeper, and, their bodies being totally submerged, they would one and all become completely helpless. When they sought the cause of this rise, the truth could not be found by reasoning. Some said that somewhere upstream a canal that had been closed had been opened and, joining with the river, had made the ford deeper, others said that rain falling in the regions above had increased the volume of the Nile. It was, however, neither of these things, but what happened was that the first crossing of the ford had been freer from danger because the sand at the crossing had been undisturbed, but in the course of the other crossings by the horses and elephants which had gone over before and then by the infantry, the sand, trodden by their feet and set in motion by the current, was carried downstream, and the place of crossing being hollowed out in this way, the ford became deeper in the middle of the river. Since the rest of his army was unable to cross the river for this reason, Perdiccas was in great difficulty, and, as those who had crossed were not strong enough to fight the enemy and those on the nearer bank were not able to go to the aid of their fellows, he ordered all to come back again. When all were thus forced to cross the stream, those who knew how to swim well and were strongest of body succeeded in swimming across the Nile with great distress, after throwing away a good deal of their equipment, but of the rest, because of their lack of skill some were swallowed by the river and others were cast up on the shore toward the enemy, but most of them, carried along for some time, were devoured by the animals in the river. Since more than two thousand men were lost, among them some of the prominent commanders, the rank and file of the army became ill-disposed toward Perdiccas. Ptolemy, however, burned the bodies of those who were cast up on his side of the river and, having bestowed on them a proper funeral, sent the bones to the relatives and friends of the dead. These things having been done, the Macedonians with Perdiccas became much more exasperated with him, but they turned with favor toward Ptolemy. When night had come, the encampment was filled with lamentations and mourning, so many men having been senselessly lost without a blow from an enemy, and of these no fewer than a thousand having become food for beasts. Therefore many of the commanders joined together and accused Perdiccas, and all the phalanx of the infantry, now alienated from him, made clear their own hostility with threatening shouts. Consequently, about a hundred of the commanders were the first to revolt from him, of whom the most illustrious was Pithon, who had suppressed the rebellious Greeks, a man second to none of the companions of Alexander in courage and reputation. Next, some also of the cavalry conspired together and went to the tent of Perdiccas, where they fell on him in a body and stabbed him to death. On the next day when there was an assembly of the soldiers, Ptolemy came, greeted the Macedonians, and spoke in defense of his own attitude, and as their supplies had run short, he provided at his own expense grain in abundance for the armies and filled the camp with the other needful things. Although he gained great applause and was in position to assume the guardianship of the kings through the favor of the rank and file, he did not grasp at this, but rather, since he owed a debt of gratitude to Pithon and Aradeus, he used his influence to give them the supreme command. For the Macedonians, when the question of the primacy was raised in the assembly and Ptolemy advocated this course, without a dissenting voice enthusiastically elected as guardians of the kings and regents Pithon and that Aradeus who had conveyed the body of Alexander. So Perdiccas, after he had ruled for three years, lost both his command and his life in the manner described. Immediately after the death of Perdiccas there came men announcing that, in a battle fought near Cappadocia, Eumenes had been victorious and Craterus and Neoptolemus had been defeated and killed. If this had become known two days before the death of Perdiccas, no one would have dared raise a hand against him because of his great good fortune. 
Now, however, the Macedonians, on learning the news about Eumenes, passed sentence of death upon him and upon fifty of the chief men of his following, among whom was Alcides, the brother of Perdiccas. They also slew the most faithful of Perdiccas' friends and his sister Adelante, the wife of Adelus, the man who had received command of the fleet. After the murder of Perdiccas, Adelus, who had the command of the fleet, was waiting at Pelusium, but when he learned of the murder of his wife and of Perdiccas, he set sail and came to Tyre with the fleet. The commandant of the garrison of that city, Archelaus, who was a Macedonian by race, welcomed Adelus and surrendered the city to him and also the funds that had been given him by Perdiccas for safekeeping and had now been honorably repaid, being in amount 800 talents. Adelus remained in Tyre, receiving those of the friends of Perdiccas who escaped in safety from the camp before Memphis. After the departure of Antipater for Asia, the Aetolians, in accordance with their compact with Perdiccas, made a campaign into Thessaly for the purpose of diverting Antipater. They had 12,000 foot soldiers and 400 horsemen, and their general was Alexander, an Aetolian. On the march, they besieged the city of the Amphitian Locrians, overran their country, and captured some of the neighboring towns. They defeated Antipater's general Polycles in battle, killing him and no small number of his soldiers. Some of those who were taken captive they sold, others they released on receiving ransoms. Invading Thessaly next, they persuaded most of the Thessalians to join them in the war against Antipater, and a force was quickly gathered, numbering in all 25,000 infantry and 1,500 cavalry. While they were gaining the cities, however, the Acarnanians, who were hostile to the Aetolians, invaded Aetolia, where they began to plunder the land and to besiege the cities. When the Aetolians learned that their own country was in danger, they left the other troops in Thessaly, putting men in a Pharsalus in command, while they themselves with the citizen soldiers went swiftly into Aetolia and, by striking fear into the Acarnanians, freed their native cities from danger. While, however, they were engaged in these matters, Polyperkin, who had been left in Macedonia as general, came into Thessaly with a considerable army and, by defeating the enemy in a battle in which he killed the general Menon and cut most of his army to pieces, recovered Thessaly. In Asia Aridaeus and Pithon, the guardians of the kings, setting out from the Nile with the kings and the army, came to Triparadiasis in Upper Syria. There Eurydice, the queen, was interfering in many matters and working against the efforts of the guardians. Pithon and his colleague were distressed by this, and when they saw that the Macedonians were paying more and more attention to her commands, they summoned a meeting of the assembly and resigned the guardianship, whereupon the Macedonians elected Antipater guardian with full power. When Antipater arrived at Triparadiasis a few days later, he found Eurydice stirring up discord and turning the Macedonians away from him. There was great disorder in the army, but a general assembly was called together, and Antipater put an end to the tumult by addressing the crowd, and by thoroughly frightening Eurydice he persuaded her to keep quiet. Thereafter, he distributed the satrapies anew. To Ptolemy he assigned what was already his, for it was impossible to displace him, since he seemed to be holding Egypt by virtue of his own prowess as if it were a prize of war. He gave Syria to Laomedon of Mytilene and Cilicia to Philoxenus. Of the upper satrapies Mesopotamia and Arbolitis were given to Amphimachus, Babylonia to Seleucus, Susan to Antigenes because he had been foremost in making the attack on Perdiccas, Persia to Pusestes, Carmania to Tupolemus, Media to Pithon, Parthia to Philip, Arya and Drangene to Sassander of Cyprus, Bactrian and Sogdian to Stasner of Soli, who was from that same island. He added Peripanicity to the domain of Oxyards, father of Alexander's wife Roxanne, and the part of India bordering on Peripanicity to Pithon son of Agenor. Of the two neighboring kingdoms, the one along the Indus River was assigned to Porus and that along the Hydasps to Taxiles, for it was not possible to remove these kings without employing a royal army and an outstanding general. Of the satrapies that faced the north, Cappadocia was assigned to Nicanor, Great Phrygia and Lycia to Antigonus as before, Curia to Asander, Lydia to Clytus, and Hellespontine Phrygia to Aridaeus. As general of the royal army he appointed Antigonus, assigning him the task of finishing the war against Eumenes and Alcides, but he attached his own son Cassander to Antigonus as Chiliarch so that the latter might not be able to pursue his own ambitions undetected. Antipater himself with the kings and his own army went on into Macedonia in order to restore the kings to their native land. Antigonus, who had been designated general of Asia for the purpose of finishing the war with Eumenes, collected his troops from their winter quarters. 
After making preparations for the battle, he set out against Eumenes, who was still in Cappadocia. Now one of Eumenes distinguished commanders named Perdiccas had deserted him and was encamped at a distance of three days' march with the soldiers who had joined him in the mutiny, three thousand infantry and five hundred cavalry. Eumenes, accordingly, sent against him Phoenix of Tenedos, with four thousand picked foot soldiers and a thousand horsemen. After a forced night march Phoenix fell unexpectedly on the deserters at about the second watch of the night, and catching them asleep, took Perdiccas alive and secured control of his troops. Eumenes put to death the leaders who had been most responsible for the desertion, but by distributing the common soldiers among the other troops and treating them with kindness, he secured them as loyal supporters. Thereafter Antigonus sent messages to a certain Apollonides, who commanded the cavalry in the army of Eumenes, and by great promises secretly persuaded him to become a traitor and to desert during the battle. While Eumenes was encamped in a plain of Cappadocia well suited for cavalry fighting, Antigonus fell upon him with all his men and took the foothills that commanded the plain. Antigonus at that time had more than 10,000 foot soldiers, half of whom were Macedonians admirable for their hardihood, 2,000 mounted troops, and 30 elephants, while Eumenes commanded not less than 20,000 infantry and 5,000 cavalry. But when the battle became hot and Apollonides with his cavalry unexpectedly deserted his own side, Antigonus won the day and slew about 8,000 of the enemy. He also became master of the entire supply train, so that Eumenes' soldiers were both dismayed by the defeat and despondent at the loss of their supplies. After this Eumenes undertook to escape into Armenia and to bring over to his alliance some of the inhabitants of that land, but as he was being overtaken and saw that his soldiers were going over to Antigonus, he occupied a stronghold called Nora. This fortress was very small with a circuit of not more than two stades, but of wonderful strength, for its buildings had been constructed close together on the top of a lofty crag, and it had been marvelously fortified, partly by nature, partly by the work of men's hands. Furthermore, it contained a stock of grain, firewood, and salt, ample to supply for many years all the needs of those who took refuge there. Eumenes was accompanied in his flight by those of his friends who were exceptionally loyal and had determined to die along with him if it came to the worst straits. In all, counting both cavalry and infantry, there were about six hundred souls. Now that Antigonus had taken over the army that had been with Eumenes, had become master of Eumenes' satrapies together with their revenues, and had seized a great sum of money besides, he aspired to greater things, for there was no longer any commander in all Asia who had an army strong enough to compete with him for supremacy. Therefore, although maintaining for the time being a pretense of being well disposed toward Antipater, he had decided that, as soon as he had made his own position secure, he would no longer take orders either from the kings or from Antipater. Accordingly, he first surrounded those who had fled to the stronghold with double walls, ditches, and amazing palisades, but then he parleyed with Eumenes, renewed the former friendship, and tried to persuade him to cast his lot with him. Eumenes, however, being well aware that fortune changes quickly, insisted upon greater concessions than his existing circumstances justified, in fact, he thought that he ought to be given back the satrapies that had been originally assigned to him and be cleared of all the charges. But Antigonus referred these matters to Antipater, and then, after placing a sufficient guard about the fortress, he set out to meet those commanders of the enemy who survived and had troops, namely Alcides, who was brother of Perdiccas, and Attalus, who commanded the whole fleet. Eumenes later sent envoys to Antipater to discuss the terms of surrender. Their leader was Hieronymus, who has written the history of the successors. Eumenes himself, who had experienced many and various changes in the circumstances of his life, was not cast down in spirit, since he knew well that fortune makes sudden changes in both directions. He saw, on the one hand, that the kings of the Macedonians held an empty pretense of royalty, and on the other, that many men of lofty ambitions were succeeding to the positions of command, and that each of them wished to act in his own interests. He hoped, therefore, as truly happened, that many would have need of him because of his judgment and his experience in warfare, and even more because of his unusual steadfastness to any pledge. Seeing that the horses, unable to exercise themselves because of the rough and confined space, would become unfit for use in mounted battle, Eumenes devised a certain strange and extraordinary exercise for them. Attaching their heads by ropes to beams or pegs and lifting them two or three double palms, he forced them to rest their weight upon their hind feet with their forefeet just clearing the ground. 
At once each horse, in effort to find footing for its four feet, began to struggle with its whole body and with its legs, all its members sharing in the exertion. At such activity sweat poured freely from the body and thus kept the animals in top condition through their excessive labors. He gave the same rations to all the soldiers, sharing in their simple food himself, and by his unchanging affability he gained great goodwill for himself and secured harmony among all his fellow refugees. Such was the situation of Eumenes and of those who had fled to the rock with him. As for Egypt, Ptolemy, after he had unexpectedly rid himself of Perdiccas and the royal forces, was holding that land as if it were a prize of war. Seeing that Phoenicia and Coel Syria, as it was called, were conveniently situated for an offensive against Egypt, he set about in earnest to become master of those regions. Accordingly, he dispatched an adequate army with Nicanor as general, a man selected from among his friends. The latter marched into Syria, took the satrap Laomedon captive, and subdued the whole land. After he had likewise secured the allegiance of the cities of Phoenicia and placed garrisons in them, he returned to Egypt, having made a short and effective campaign. When Apollodorus was archon at Athens, the Romans elected Quintus Papilius and Quintus Poplius to the consulship. During their term Antigonus, who had defeated Eumenes, decided to make war against Alcides and Attalus, for these two remained from the friends and household of Perdiccas, noteworthy generals with soldiers enough to make a bid for power. Therefore Antigonus set out with all his forces from Cappadocia and pushed on toward Pisidia, where Alcides and his army were staying. Making a forced march that strained the endurance of his men to the utmost, he traversed 2,500 states in seven days and the same number of nights, reaching Cartopolis, as it is called. He escaped the notice of the enemy because of the rapidity of his march, and drawing close to them while they were still ignorant of his coming, he stole a march on them by occupying certain rugged ridges. As soon as Alcides learned that the enemy was at hand, he drew up his phalanx at top speed and with a mounted force attacked the troops that were holding the ridge, trying with all his might to get the best of them by force and hurl them from the hill. A stubborn battle was waged and many fell on both sides, then Antigonus led six thousand horsemen in a violent charge against the phalanx of the enemy in order to cut Alcides' line of retreat to it. When this maneuver had been successfully completed, the forces on the ridge, who were far superior in number and also had an advantage from the difficulty of the terrain, routed the attackers. Alcides, whose retreat to the infantry had been cut off and who was caught in a trap by the superior numbers of the enemy, faced imminent destruction. Therefore now that survival itself was difficult, he abandoned many of his men and hardly escaped to the phalanx of the footmen. Antigonus, however, led his elephants and his whole army down from a higher position and struck panic into his opponents, who were far inferior to him in number, for they were in all sixteen thousand foot and nine hundred horse, while Antigonus, in addition to the elephants, had more than forty thousand foot soldiers and above seven thousand horsemen. The elephants were now attacking the army of Alcides from the front, and at the same time the horsemen because of superior numbers were pouring about them on all sides, while a force of infantry, which far outnumbered them and also surpassed them in valor, was holding a position above them. At this, tumult and panic began to grip Alcides' soldiers, and because of the great rapidity and force of the attack, he was unable to draw up the phalanx properly. The rout was complete. Attalus, Ducimus, Polmon, and many of the more important officers were taken captive, but Alcides, accompanied by his own guards and attendants, escaped with his Pisidian allies to a city of Pisidia called Termesis. Antigonus obtained the surrender of all the rest by negotiation and enrolled them in his own ranks, by his kind treatment of them he brought no small addition to his forces. The Pisidians, however, who numbered six thousand and were of outstanding prowess, bade Alcides be of good courage, promising that they would in no way fail him, for they were exceedingly well disposed to him for the following reasons. Since Alcides had had no supporters in Asia after the death of Perdiccas, he had decided to show kindness to the Pisidians, thinking that he would thus secure his allies men who were warlike and who possessed a country difficult to invade and well supplied with strongholds. For this reason, during the campaigns he honored them exceedingly above all the allies and distributed to them spoils from the hostile territory, assigning them half the booty. By employing the most friendly language in his conversation with them, by each day inviting the most important of them in turn to his table at banquets, and finally by honoring many of them with gifts of considerable value, he secured them as loyal supporters. Therefore, even at this time Alcides placed his hopes upon them, and they did not disappoint his hopes. 
for when Antigonus encamped near Termessus with all his army and demanded Alcides, and even when the older men advised that he be surrendered, the younger, forming a compact group in opposition to their parents, voted to meet every danger in the interest of his safety. The older men at first tried to persuade the younger not to permit their native land to become the spoil of war for the sake of a single Macedonian, but when they saw the young men's determination was not to be shaken, after taking counsel in secret, they sent an embassy to Antigonus by night, promising to surrender Alcides either alive or dead. They asked him to attack the city for a number of days and, drawing the defenders forward by light skirmishing, to withdraw as if in flight. They said that, when this had happened and the young men were engaged in the battle at a distance from the city, they would seize a suitable occasion for their own undertaking. Antigonus, prevailed on by them, shifted his camp a long way from the city, and by skirmishing with the young men kept drawing them into battle outside the city. When the older men saw that Alcides had been left alone, selecting the most trustworthy of the slaves and those of the citizens in the prime of life who were not working in his behalf, they made their attempt while the young men were still away. They could not, it is true, take him alive, for he laid hands on himself first in order not to come into the power of his enemies while still living, but his body, laid on a bier and covered with a coarse cloak, they carried out through the gates and delivered to Antigonus without attracting the attention of the skirmishers. By thus delivering their state from danger by their own devices, they averted the war, but they could not escape the disaffection of the younger men, for as soon as these on their return from the fighting heard what had happened, they became enraged at their kinsfolk on account of their own excessive devotion to Alcides. At first they gained possession of part of the town and voted to set the buildings on fire and then, rushing from the town under arms and keeping to the mountains, to plunder the country that was subject to Antigonus. Later, however, they changed their minds and refrained from burning the city, but they devoted themselves to brigandage and guerrilla warfare, ravaging much of the hostile territory. As for Antigonus, he took the body of Alcides and maltreated it for three days, then, as the corpse began to decay, he threw it out unburied and departed from Pisidia. But the young men of Termessus, still preserving their goodwill for the victim, recovered the body and honored it with splendid obsequies. Thus kindness in its very nature possesses the peculiar power of a love charm in behalf of benefactors, preserving unchanged men's goodwill toward them. Be that as it may, Antigonus set out from Pisidia and marched toward Phrygia with all his forces. When he had come to Cretopolis, Aristodemus of Miletus met him with the news that Antipater had died, and that the supreme command and the guardianship of the kings had fallen to Polyperchon the Macedonian. Being delighted at what had happened, he was carried away by hope and made up his mind to maintain a firm grip upon the government of Asia and to yield the rule of that continent to no one. This was the situation in regard to Antigonus Stadeus to Macedonia, after Antipater had been stricken by a rather serious illness, which old age was tending to make fatal, the Athenians sent to maids as envoy to Antipater, a man who had the reputation of serving the city well in relation to Macedonia. They requested Antipater that he, as had been agreed from the beginning, remove the garrison from Munichia. Antipater at first had been well disposed to Demades, but after the death of Perdiccas certain letters were found in the royal archives in which Demades invited Perdiccas to cross over swiftly into Europe against Antipater. At this Antipater was alienated from him and kept his enmity hidden. Therefore when Demades in accordance with the instructions given him by the people demanded the fulfillment of the promise and indulged rather freely in threats about the garrison, Antipater gave him no answer but delivered Demades himself and his son Demes, who had accompanied his father as an envoy, to those ministers who were in charge of punishments. They were taken away to a common prison and put to death for the reasons mentioned above. Antipater, who was already at the point of death, appointed as guardian of the kings and supreme commander, Polyperchon, who was almost the oldest of those who had campaigned with Alexander and was held in honor by the Macedonians. Antipater also made his own son Cassander Chiliarch and second in authority. The position and rank of Chiliarch had first been brought to fame and honor by the Persian kings, and afterwards under Alexander it gained great power and glory at the time when he became an admirer of this and all other Persian customs. For this reason Antipater, following the same course, appointed his son Cassander, since he was young, to the office of Chiliarch. Cassander, however, did not approve of the arrangement made by his father, regarding it as outrageous that one not related by blood should succeed to the command of his father, and this while there was a son who was capable of directing public affairs and who had already given sufficient proof of his ability and courage. 
First going with his friends into the country where he had plenty of opportunity and leisure, he talked to them about the supreme command, then, taking them apart one by one, he kept urging them privately to join him in establishing his dominion, and having won them by great promises, he made them ready for the joint enterprise. He also sent envoys in secret to Ptolemy, renewing their friendship and urging him to join the alliance and to send a fleet as soon as possible from Phoenicia to the Hellespont. In like manner, he sent messengers to the other commanders and cities to urge them to ally themselves with him. He himself, however, by making arrangements for a hunt to last many days, avoided suspicion of complicity in the revolt. After Polyperkin had assumed the guardianship of the kings and had consulted with his friends, with their approval he summoned Olympias, asking her to assume the care of Alexander's son, who was still a child, and to live in Macedonia with regal dignity. It so happened that some time before this Olympias had fled to Epirus as an exile because of her quarrel with Antipater. This was the state of affairs in Macedonia. In Asia, as soon as the death of Antipater was noised abroad, there was a first stirring of revolution, since each of those in power undertook to work for his own ends. Antigonus, who was foremost of these, had already won a victory over Eumenes in Cappadocia and had taken over his army, and he had also completely defeated Alcides and Attalus in Pisidia and had annexed their troops. Moreover, he had been chosen supreme commander of Asia by Antipater, and at the same time he had been appointed general of a great army, for which reasons he was filled with pride and haughtiness. Already hopefully aspiring to the supreme power, he decided to take orders neither from the kings nor from their guardians, for he took it for granted that he himself, since he had a better army, would gain possession of the treasures of all Asia, there being no one able to stand against him for at that time he had sixty thousand foot soldiers, ten thousand horsemen, and thirty elephants, and in addition to these he expected to make ready other forces also if there should be need, since Asia could provide pay without end for the mercenaries he might muster. With these plans in mind he summoned Hieronymus the historian, a friend and fellow citizen of Eumenes of Cardia, who had taken refuge in the stronghold called Nora. After endeavoring to attach Hieronymus to himself by great gifts, he sent him as an envoy to Eumenes, urging the latter to forget the battle that had been fought against him in Cappadocia, to become his friend and ally, to receive gifts many times the value of what he had formerly possessed and a greater satrapy, and in general to be the first of Antigonus' friends and his partner in the whole undertaking. Antigonus also at once called a council of his friends and, after he had made them acquainted with his design for gaining imperial power, assigned satrapies to some of the more important friends and military commands to others, and by holding up great expectations to all of them, he filled them with enthusiasm for his undertakings. Indeed, he had in mind to go through Asia, remove the existing satraps, and reorganize the positions of command in favor of his friends. While Antigonus was engaged in these matters, Aridaeus, the satrap of Hellespontine Phrygia, discovering his plan, decided to provide for the safety of his own satrapy and also to secure the most considerable cities by means of garrisons. As the city of the Cisaceni was strategically most important and very large, he set out against it with an infantry force consisting of more than 10,000 mercenaries, a thousand Macedonians, and 500 Persian bowmen and slingers. He had also 800 horsemen, all kinds of missiles, catapults both for bolts and for stones, and all the other equipment proper for storming a city. After falling suddenly upon the city and intercepting a great multitude in the outlying territory, he applied himself to the siege and, by terrifying those who were in the city, tried to force them to receive a garrison. Since the attack had been unexpected, most of the Cisaceni had been cut off in the country, and with only a few people left in the city, they were completely unprepared for the siege. Deciding, nevertheless, to maintain their freedom, they openly sent envoys to confer with Aridaeus about raising the siege, saying that the city would do anything for him except receive a garrison, but secretly, after assembling the young men and selecting the slaves who were suitable for the purpose, they armed them and manned the wall with defenders. When Aridaeus insisted that the city admit a garrison, the envoys said that they wished to consult the people in regard to this. As the satrap agreed, they obtained a truce, and during that day and the following night they improved their preparations for withstanding the siege. Aridaeus, outwitted, missed his opportunity and was balked of his expected success, for since the Cisaceni possessed a city that was strong and very easy to defend from attacks by land thanks to its being a peninsula, and since they controlled the sea, they easily warded off the enemy. Moreover, they sent for soldiers from Byzantium and for missiles and whatever else was of use for withstanding the attack. 
When the people of Byzantium supplied all this quickly and willingly, the Cisaceni became confident and set themselves courageously against the danger. They also launched ships of war at once and, coasting along the shore, recovered and brought back those who were in the country. Soon they had plenty of soldiers, and after killing many of the besieging force, they rid themselves of the siege. Thus Aridius, outgeneraled by the Cisaceni, returned to his own satrapy without accomplishing anything. Antigonus happened to be tarrying in Selene when he learned that Cyzicus was being besieged. Deciding to get possession of the endangered city in view of his forthcoming undertakings, he selected the best from all his army, 20,000 infantry and 3,000 cavalry. Taking these he set out in haste to aid the Cisaceni. He was a little too late, but he made his goodwill toward the city manifest, even though failing to gain his entire object. He sent envoys to Aridius, bringing against him these charges, first, that he had dared to besiege a Greek city that was an ally and not guilty of any offense, and second, that he clearly intended rebellion and was converting his satrapy into a private domain. Finally, he ordered him to retire from his satrapy and, retaining a single city as a residence, to remain quiet. Aridius, however, after listening to the envoys and censuring the arrogance of their words, refused to retire from his satrapy and said that in occupying the cities with garrisons he was making the first move in his war to a finish with Antigonus. In accordance with this decision, after making the city secure, he sent away a part of his army and a general in command of it. He ordered the latter to get in touch with Eumenes, relieve the fortress from siege, and when he had freed Eumenes from danger, make him an ally Antigonus, who was anxious to retaliate upon Aridius, sent a force to carry on the war against him, but he himself with a sufficient army set out for Lydia, from which province he wished to expel the satrap, Clytus. The latter, foreseeing the attack, secured the more important cities with garrisons, but he himself went by ship to Macedonia to reveal to the kings and to Polyperkin the bold revolt of Antigonus and to beg for aid. Antigonus took Ephesus at the first assault with the aid of certain confederates within the city. After this, when Aeschylus of Rhodes sailed to Ephesus conveying from Cilicia in four ships six hundred talents of silver that were being sent to Macedonia for the kings, Antigonus laid hands on it, saying that he needed it to pay his mercenaries. By doing this, he made it clear that he had begun to act for his own ends and was opposing the kings. Then after storming Syme, he advanced against the cities in order, taking some of them by force and winning others by persuasion. Now that we have finished the activities of Antigonus, we shall turn our narrative to the fortunes of Eumenes. This man experienced great and incredible reversals of fortune, continually having a share in good and evil beyond expectation. For example, in the period preceding these events, when he was fighting for Perdiccas and the kings, he had received as his satrapy Cappadocia and the adjacent regions, in which as master of great armies and much wealth his good fortune became famous. For he defeated in a pitched battle Craterus and Neoptolemus, famous generals in command of the invincible forces of the Macedonian, and killed them on the field. But although he won the reputation of being irresistible, he experienced such a change of fortune that he was defeated by Antigonus in a great battle and compelled to take refuge with a few friends in a certain very small fortress. Shut up there and surrounded by the enemy with a double wall, he had no one to give him aid in his own misfortune. When the siege had lasted a year and hope of safety had been abandoned, there suddenly appeared an unexpected deliverance from his plight, for Antigonus, who was besieging him and bent on destroying him, changed his plan, invited him to share in his own undertakings, and after receiving an oath-bound pledge, freed him from the siege. Thus unexpectedly saved, after a considerable time, he stayed for the present in Cappadocia, where he gathered together his former friends and those who had once served under him and were now wandering about the country. Since he was highly esteemed, he quickly found many men to share in his expectations and to enlist for the campaign with him. In the end, within a few days, in addition to the 500 friends who had been besieged in the fortress with him, he had more than 2,000 soldiers who followed him of their own free will. With the aid of fortune, he gained so great an increase in power that he took over the royal armies and championed the kings against those who had boldly tried to end their rule. But we shall relate these events in more detail a little later in their proper place. Now that we have said enough about affairs throughout Asia, we shall turn our attention to what had taken place at the same time in Europe. Although Cassander had failed to gain the ruling position in Macedonia, he was not dismayed, but he determined to maintain his claim to it, holding it disgraceful that his father's office should be administered by others. 
since he perceived that the favor of the Macedonians inclined to Polyperkin, he had further private conversations with the friends in whom he most trusted and sent them to the Hellespont without arousing suspicion, and he himself, by spending several days at leisure in the country and organizing a hunt, created the general opinion that he would not try to gain the office. When everything necessary for his departure was ready, however, he set out from Macedonia unobserved. He came to the Chersonese and departing thence arrived at the Hellespont. Sailing across into Asia to Antigonus, he begged him to aid him, saying that Ptolemy also had promised to be an ally. Antigonus eagerly received him and promised to cooperate with him actively in every way and to give him at once a force of infantry and a fleet. In doing this, he pretended to be aiding him because of his own friendship for Antipater, but in truth it was because he wished Polyperkin to be surrounded by many great distractions so that he himself might proceed against Asia without danger and secure the supreme power for himself. Meanwhile in Macedonia, Polyperkin, the guardian of the kings, after Cassander had slipped away, foresaw the serious character of the war that was to be fought with him, and since he had made up his mind to do nothing without the advice of his friends, he called together all the commanders and the most important of the other Macedonians. It was clear that Cassander, reinforced by Antigonus, would hold the Greek cities against them, since some of the cities were guarded by his father's garrisons and others, dominated by Antipater's friends and mercenaries, were ruled by oligarchies, and since Cassander would also gain as allies both Ptolemy the ruler of Egypt, and Antigonus, who had already openly rebelled against the kings, and each of them possessed great armies and abundant wealth and was master of many nations and cities of. Consequence after the question how to fight against these had been laid before them and many shrewd suggestions had been made about the war, it was decided to free the cities throughout Greece and to overthrow the oligarchies established in them by Antipater, for in this way they would best decrease the influence of Cassander and also win for themselves great glory and many considerable allies. At once, therefore, they called together the envoys who were present from the cities, and after bidding them be of good cheer, they promised to re-establish democratic governments in the cities. As soon as they had drafted the decree that had been adopted, they gave it to the envoys, in order that they might quickly return to their native cities and report to their assemblies the goodwill that the kings and the generals entertained for the Greeks. The edict was in such terms as these. Inasmuch as it has fallen to the lot of our ancestors to perform many acts of kindness to the Greeks, we wish to maintain their policy and to make evident to all the goodwill which we continue to have for that people. Formerly, indeed, when Alexander departed from among men and the kingship descended upon us, since we believed it necessary to restore all to peace and to the forms of government that Philip our sire established, we sent letters to all the cities in regard to these matters. But whereas it happened that, while we were far away, certain of the Greeks, being ill-advised, waged war against the Macedonians and were defeated by our generals, and many bitter things befell the cities, know ye that the generals have been responsible for these hardships, but that we, holding fast to the original policy, are preparing peace for you and such governments as you enjoyed under Philip and Alexander, and that we permit you to act in all other matters according to the decrees formerly issued by them. Moreover, we restore those who have been driven out or exiled from the cities by our generals from the time when Alexander crossed into Asia, and we decree that those who are restored by us, in full possession of their property, undisturbed by faction, and enjoying a complete amnesty, shall exercise their rights as citizens in their native states, and if any measures have been passed to their disadvantage, let such measures be void, except as concerning those who had been exiled for blood guilt or impiety in accordance with the law. Not to be restored are the men of Megalopolis who were exiled for treason along with Polyanidas, nor those of Amphissa, Trica, Pharcodon, or Heraclea, but let the cities receive back the others before the thirtieth day of Xanthicus. If in any case Philip or Alexander published regulations that are inconsistent with each other, let the cities concerned present themselves before us so that, after bringing the provisions into harmony, they may follow a course of action advantageous both to us and to themselves. The Athenians shall possess everything as at the time of Philip and Alexander, save that Oropus shall belong to its own people as at present. Same as we grant to Athens, since Philip our sire also gave it to them. Let all the Greeks pass a decree that no one shall engage either in war or in public opposition to us, and that if anyone disobeys, he and his family shall be exiled and his goods shall be confiscated. We have commanded Polyperkin to take in hand these and other matters. Do you obey him, as we also have written to you formerly, for if anyone fails to carry out any of these injunctions, we shall not overlook him. 
When this edict had been published and dispatched to all the cities, Polyperkin wrote to Argos and the other cities, ordering them to exile those who had been leaders of the governments in the time of Antipater, even to condemn certain of them to death and to confiscate their property, in order that these men, completely stripped of power, might be unable to cooperate with Cassander in any way. He also wrote to Olympias, the mother of Alexander, who was staying in Epirus because of her quarrel with Cassander, asking her to return to Macedonia as soon as possible, to take charge of the son of Alexander, and to assume responsibility for him until he should become of age and receive his father's kingdom. He also sent to Eumenes, writing a letter in the name of the kings, urging him not to put an end to his enmity toward Antigonus, but turning from him to the kings, either to cross over to Macedonia, if he wished, and become a guardian of the kings in cooperation with himself, or if he preferred, to remain in Asia and after receiving an army and money fight it out with Antigonus, who had already clearly shown that he was a rebel against the kings. He said that the kings were restoring to him the satrapy that Antigonus had taken away and all the prerogatives that he had ever possessed in Asia. Finally, he set forth that it was especially fitting for Eumenes to be careful and solicitous for the royal house in conformity with his former public services in its interest. If he needed greater military power, Polyperkin promised that he himself and the kings would come from Macedonia with the entire royal army. This is what happened in that year. When Archippus was Archon of Athens, the Romans elected Quintus Elius and Lucius Papirius consuls. While these held office, Eumenes, just after he had made good his retreat from the fortress, received the letters that had been dispatched by Polyperkin. They contained, apart from what has been told above, the statement that the kings were giving him a gift of five hundred talents as recompense for the losses that he had experienced, and that to effect this they had written to the generals and treasurers in Cilicia directing them to give him the five hundred talents and whatever additional money he requested for raising mercenaries and for other pressing needs. The letter also added that they were writing to the commanders of the three thousand Macedonian silver shields ordering them to place themselves at the disposal of Eumenes and in general to cooperate wholeheartedly with him, since he had been appointed supreme commander of all Asia. There also came to him a letter from Olympias in which she begged and besought him to aid the kings and herself, saying that he alone was left, the most faithful of her friends and the one able to remedy the isolation of the royal house. Olympias asked him to advise her whether he thought it better for her to remain in Epirus and place no trust in those who were from time to time supposed to be guardians of the kings, but were in truth trying to transfer the kingdom to themselves, or to return to Macedonia. Eumenes at once replied to Olympias, advising her to remain in Epirus for the present until the war should come to some decision. As for himself, since he had always observed the most unwavering loyalty toward the kings, he decided not to take orders from Antigonus, who was trying to appropriate the kingship for himself, but since the son of Alexander was in need of help because of his orphan state and the greediness of the commanders, he believed that it was incumbent upon himself to run every risk for the safety of the kings. Immediately, therefore, Eumenes bade his men break camp and departed from Cappadocia with about five hundred horsemen and more than two thousand foot soldiers. Indeed, he did not have time to wait for the laggards among those who had promised to join him, for a considerable army was drawing near, sent from Antigonus under the general Menander to prevent Eumenes from staying in Cappadocia now that he had become an enemy of Antigonus. In fact, when this army arrived three days later, although it had missed its opportunity, it undertook to follow those who had gone with Eumenes, but since it was not able to come up with them, it returned to Cappadocia. Eumenes himself quickly passed over the Taurus by forced marches and entered Cilicia. Antigenes and Tatamus, the leaders of the Silver Shields, in obedience to the letters of the kings, came from a considerable distance to meet Eumenes and his friends. After bidding him welcome and congratulating him on his unexpected escape from very great dangers, they promised to cooperate willingly with him in everything. The Macedonian silver shields, about three thousand in number, likewise met him with friendship and zeal. All wondered at the incredible fickleness of fortune when they considered that a little while before the kings and the Macedonians had condemned Eumenes and his friends to death, but now, forgetting their own decision, they not only had let him off scot-free of punishment but also had entrusted to him the supreme command over the entire kingdom. And it was with good reason that these emotions were shared by all who then beheld the reversals in Eumenes' fortunes, for who, taking thought of the inconstancies of human life, would not be astonished at the alternating ebb and flow of fortune? Or who, putting his trust in the predominance he enjoys when fortune favors him, would adopt a bearing too high for mortal weakness? 
For human life, as if some god were at the helm, moves in a cycle through good and evil alternately for all time. It is not strange, then, that some one unforeseen event has taken place, but rather that all that happens is not unexpected. This is also a good reason for admitting the claim of history, for in the inconstancy and irregularity of events history furnishes a corrective for both the arrogance of the fortunate and the despair of the destitute. You means, who at this time also kept these things in mind, prudently made his own position secure, for he foresaw that fortune would change again. He perceived that he himself was a foreigner and had no claim to the royal power, that the Macedonians who were now subject to him had previously decreed his death, and that those who occupied the military commands were filled with arrogance and were aiming at great affairs. He therefore understood that he would soon be despised and at the same time envied, and that his life would eventually be in danger, for no one will willingly carry out orders given by those whom he regards as his inferiors, or be patient when he has over him as masters those who ought themselves to be subject to others. Reasoning about these matters with himself, when the five hundred talents for refitting and organization were offered him in accordance with the king's letters, he at first refused to accept them, saying that he had no need of such a gift as he had no desire to attain any position of command. Even now, he said, it was not of his own will that he had yielded with respect to his present office, but he had been compelled by the kings to undertake this great task. In any case, owing to his continuous military service, he was no longer able to endure the skirmishes and journeyings, especially since no magistracy was in prospect for one who was an alien and hence was excluded from the power that belonged of right to the Macedonians. He declared, however, that in his sleep he had seen a strange vision, which he considered it necessary to disclose to all, for he thought it would contribute much to harmony and the general good. He said that in his sleep he had seemed to see Alexander the king, alive and clad in his kingly garb, presiding over a council, giving orders to the commanders, and actively administering all the affairs of the monarchy. Therefore, he said, I think that we must make ready a golden throne from the royal treasure, and that after the diadem, the scepter, the crown, and the rest of the insignia have been placed on it, all the commanders must at daybreak offer incense to Alexander before it, hold the meetings of the council in its presence, and receive their orders in the name of the king just as if he were alive and at the head of his own kingdom. As all agreed to his proposal, everything needed was quickly made ready, for the royal treasure was rich in gold. Straightway then, when a magnificent tent had been set up, the throne was erected, upon which were placed the diadem, the scepter, and the armor that Alexander had been wont to use. Then when an altar with a fire upon it had been put in place, all the commanders would make sacrifice from a golden casket, presenting frankincense and the most costly of the other kinds of incense and making obeisance to Alexander as to a god. After this those who exercised command would sit in the many chairs that had been placed about and take counsel together, deliberating upon the matters that from time to time required their attention. You means, by placing himself on an equality with the other commanders in all the matters that were discussed and by seeking their favor through the most friendly intercourse, wore down the envy with which he had been regarded and secured for himself a great deal of goodwill among the commanders. As their reverence for the king grew stronger, they were all filled with happy expectations, just as if some god were leading them. And by conducting himself toward the Macedonian silver shields in a similar way, you means gained great favor among them as a man worthy of the solicitude of the kings. You means selected the most able of his friends, gave them ample funds, and sent them out to engage mercenaries, establishing a notable rate of pay. Some of them went at once into Pisidia, Lycia, and the adjacent regions, where they zealously enrolled troops. Others traveled through Cilicia, others through Coel Syria and Phoenicia, and some through the cities in Cyprus. Since the news of this levy spread widely and the pay offered was worthy of consideration, many reported of their own free will even from the cities of Greece and were enrolled for the campaign. In a short time more than 10,000 foot soldiers and 2,000 horsemen were gathered together, not including the silver shields and those who had accompanied Eumenes. At Eumenes' unexpected and sudden rise to power, Ptolemy, who had sailed to Zephyrium in Cilicia with a fleet, kept sending to the commanders of the silver shields, exhorting them not to pay any attention to Eumenes, whom all the Macedonians had condemned to death. Likewise, he sent to those who had been placed in command of the garrisons in Syinda, protesting solemnly against their giving any of the money to Eumenes, and promised to guarantee their safety. But no one paid any attention to him because the kings and Polyperchon their guardian and also Olympias, the mother of Alexander, had written to them that they should serve Eumenes in every way, since he was the commander-in-chief of the kingdom. 
Antigonus in particular was displeased with the advancement of Eumenes and the magnitude of the power that was being concentrated in him, for he assumed that Eumenes was being made ready by Polyperkin as the strongest antagonist of himself now that he had become a rebel against the monarchy. Deciding, therefore, to organize a plot against Eumenes, he selected Philodas, one of his friends, and gave him a letter that he had written to the Silver Shields and to the other Macedonians with Eumenes. With him, he also sent thirty other Macedonians, meddlesome and talkative persons, whom he instructed to meet separately with Antigenes and Tatamus, the commanders of the Silver Shields, and through them to organize some plot against Eumenes by promising great gifts and greater satrapies. Antigonus also told them to get in touch with their acquaintances and fellow citizens among the Silver Shields and secure their support for the plot against Eumenes by corrupting them with bribes. Now although they were unable to persuade any others, Tatamus, the leader of the Silver Shields, was bribed and undertook to persuade his fellow commander, Antigenes, to share in the enterprise. Antigenes, however, who was a man of great shrewdness and trustworthiness, not only argued against this, but he even won back the man who had been bribed, for he showed him that it was to his advantage that Eumenes rather than Antigonus should remain alive. The latter, indeed, if he became more powerful, would take away their satrapies and set up some of his friends in their places, Eumenes, however, since he was a foreigner, would never dare to advance his own interests, but, remaining a general, would treat them as friends and, if they cooperated with him, would protect their satrapies for them and perhaps give them others also. So those who were contriving plots against Eumenes met with failure in the way described. When, however, Philotas gave the commanders the letter that had been addressed to all in common, the Silver Shields and the other Macedonians came together privately without Eumenes and ordered the letter to be read. In it Antigonus had written an accusation against Eumenes and had exhorted the Macedonians to seize Eumenes quickly and put him to death. If they should not do this, he said that he would come with his whole army to wage war against them and that upon those who refused to obey he would inflict suitable punishment. At the reading of this letter the commanders and all the Macedonians found themselves in great perplexity, for it was necessary for them either to side with the kings and receive punishment from Antigonus, or to obey Antigonus and be chastised by Polyperkin and the kings. While the troops were in this confused state, Eumenes entered and, after reading the letter, urged the Macedonians to follow the decrees of the kings and not listen to one who had become a rebel. He discussed many matters pertinent to the subject and not only freed himself from the imminent danger but also gained greater favor with the crowd than before. Thus once more Eumenes, after falling into unforeseen danger, unexpectedly made his own power greater. Therefore he ordered the soldiers to break camp and led them to Phoenicia, desiring to gather ships from all the cities and assemble a considerable fleet, so that Polyperkin, by the addition of the Phoenician ships, might have control of the sea and be able to transport the Macedonian armies safely to Asia against Antigonus whenever he wished. Accordingly, he remained in Phoenicia preparing the naval force. Meanwhile, Nicanor, the commander of Munichia, on hearing that Cassander had gone from Macedonia to Antigonus and that Polyperkin was expected to come shortly into Attica with his army, asked the Athenians to continue to favor Cassander. No one approved, but all thought that it was necessary to get rid even of the garrison as soon as possible. Nicanor therefore at first deceived the assembly and persuaded them to wait for a few days, saying that Cassander would do what was for the advantage of the city, but then, while the Athenians remained inactive for a short time, he secretly introduced soldiers into Munichia by night, a few at a time, so that there was a force there strong enough to maintain the guard and fight against any who undertook to besiege the garrison. The Athenians, when they found out that Nicanor was not acting honorably with them, sent an embassy to the kings and to Polyperkin, asking them to send aid in accordance with the edict that had been issued concerning the autonomy of the Greeks, and they themselves, holding frequent meetings of the assembly, considered what ought to be done about the war with Nicanor. While they were still engaged in this discussion, Nicanor, who had hired many mercenaries, made a secret sally by night and took the walls of the Piraeus and the harbor boom. The Athenians, who not only had failed to recapture Munichia but also had lost the Piraeus, were angry. They therefore selected as envoys some of the prominent citizens who were friends of Nicanor, Phocian the son of Phocus, Conon the son of Timotheus, and Clearchus the son of Nausicles, and sent them to Nicanor to complain about what he had done and also to request him to restore their autonomy according to the edict that had been issued. Nicanor, however, answered that they should direct their mission to Cassander, since as a garrison commander appointed by Cassander he himself had no power of independent action. 
At this time, a letter came at once Nicanor from Olympias, in which she ordered him to restore Munichia and the Piraeus to the Athenians. Since Nicanor had heard that the kings and Polyperchon were going to bring Olympias back to Macedonia, entrust to her the upbringing of the boy, and re-establish her in the state and honor that she had enjoyed during the lifetime of Alexander, he was frightened and promised to make the restoration, but he avoided the fulfillment of the promise by constantly making excuses. The Athenians, who had had great respect for Olympias in former times and now regarded the honors that had been decreed for her as actually in effect, were filled with joy, hoping that through her favor the recovery of their autonomy might be accomplished without risk. While the promise was still unfulfilled, however, Alexander the son of Polyperchon arrived in Attica with an army. The Athenians, indeed, believed that he had come to give back Munichia and the Piraeus to the people, this, however, was not the truth, but on the contrary he had come from interested motives to take both of them himself for use in the war. Now certain Athenians who had been friends of Antipater, of whom Phocian was one, fearing the punishment due them in accordance with the laws, went to Alexander and, by showing him what was to his own advantage, persuaded him to hold the forts for himself and not deliver them to the Athenians until after the defeat of Cassander. Alexander, who had pitched his camp near the Piraeus, did not admit the Athenians to his parley with Nicanor, but by conferring with him in private and negotiating secretly, he made it evident that he did not intend to deal fairly with the Athenians. The people, coming together in an assembly, removed from office the existing magistrates, filling the offices with men from the extreme Democrats, and they condemned those who had held office under the oligarchy, decreeing the death penalty for some of them, exile and confiscation of property for others, among whom was Phocian, who had held supreme authority under Antipater. These men, on being driven from the city, fled to Alexander the son of Polyperchon and strove to secure safety for themselves through his good offices. They were well received by him and given letters to his father, Polyperchon, urging that Phocian and his friends should suffer no ill, since they had favored his interests and now promised to cooperate with him in every way. The Athenian people also sent an embassy to Polyperchon laying charges against Phocian and praying Polyperchon to restore to them Munichia and their autonomy. Now Polyperchon was eager to occupy the Piraeus with a garrison because the port could be of great service to him in meeting the needs of the wars, but since he was ashamed of acting contrary to the edict that he himself had issued, believing that he would be held faithless among the Greeks if he broke his word to the most famous city, he changed his purpose. When he had heard the embassies, he gave a favorable answer in friendly terms to the one sent by the people, but he arrested Phocian and his companions and sent them bound to Athens, granting the people the authority either to put them to death or to dismiss the charges as they pleased. When an assembly was called together in Athens and the case of Phocian and his fellows was brought forward, many of those who had been exiles in the days of Antipater and many of those who had been political opponents of the prisoners demanded the death penalty. The whole basis of the accusation was that after the Lamian War these men had been responsible for the enslavement of the fatherland and the overthrow of the democratic constitution and laws. When opportunity was given the defendants for their defense, Phocian began to deliver a plea in his own behalf, but the mob by its tumult rejected his defense, so that the defendants were left in utter helplessness. When the tumult subsided, Phocian tried again to defend himself, but the crowd shouted him down and prevented the voice of the accused from being fully heard, for the many supporters of democracy, who had been expelled from citizenship and then, beyond their hopes, had been restored, were bitter against those who had deprived Athens of its independence. As Phocian attempted to overcome the opposition and fought for his life in desperate circumstances, those who were near heard the justice of his plea, but those who were at a greater distance heard nothing because of the great uproar caused by the rioters and only beheld his gestures, which because of his great danger were impassioned and varied. Finally, abandoning hope of safety, Phocian shouted in a loud voice, begging them to condemn him to death, but to spare the others. As the fury and violence of the mob remained unalterable, certain of Phocian's friends kept coming forward to add their pleas to his. The mob would listen to their opening words, but when, as they went on, they made it clear that they were speaking for the defense, they would be driven away by the tumult and by the jeers that greeted them. Finally by the universal voice of the people the accused were condemned and led off to the prison on the way to death. They were accompanied by many good men, mourning and sympathizing with them at their great misfortune. For that men who were second to none in reputation and birth and had done many acts of human kindness during life would obtain neither a chance to defend themselves nor a fair trial turned many to arresting thoughts and fear, fortune being not only unstable but impartial to all alike. 
but many of the popular party, men who were bitter in their opposition to Phocian, kept reviling him mercilessly and cruelly charging him with their misfortunes. For when hatred, that in prosperity finds no utterance, after a change of fortune breaks out in adversity, it loses all human semblance in its rage against its object. So when, by taking the draught of hemlock according to the ancient custom, these men had ended their lives, they were all thrown unburied beyond the boundaries of Attica. In this manner died Phocian and those who had been falsely accused with him. Cassander, after receiving from Antigonus thirty-five warships and four thousand soldiers, sailed into the Piraeus. Welcomed by Nicanor, the garrison commander, he took over the Piraeus and the harbor booms, while Munichia was retained by Nicanor himself, who had enough soldiers of his own to man the fortress. Polyperkin and the kings happened to be staying in Phocis, but when Polyperkin learned of Cassander's arrival in the Piraeus, he moved into Attica and camped near the Piraeus. He had with him twenty thousand Macedonian infantry and about four thousand of the other allies, a thousand cavalry, and sixty-five elephants. It was his intention to besiege Cassander, but since he was short of supplies and supposed that the siege would be long, he was forced to leave in Attica under the command of his son Alexander the part of the army that could be supplied with food, while he himself with the larger part of the forces moved into the Peloponnesus to enforce obedience to the kings upon the people of Megalopolis, who were in sympathy with Cassander and were governed by the oligarchy that had been established by Antipater. While Polyperkin was busy with these affairs, Cassander with the fleet secured the allegiance of the people of Aegina and closely invested the Salaminians, who were hostile to him. Since he made continuous onslaughts day after day and was well supplied with both missiles and men, he reduced the Salaminians to the most desperate straits. The city was already in danger of being taken by storm when Polyperkin sent a considerable force of infantry and ships to attack the besiegers. At this Cassander was alarmed, abandoned the siege, and sailed back to the Piraeus. But Polyperkin, in anxiety to settle affairs in the Peloponnesus to his own advantage, went there and discussed with delegates, whom he had gathered from the cities, the question of their alliance with himself. He also sent envoys to the cities, ordering that those who through Antipater's influence had been made magistrates in the oligarchical governments should be put to death and that the people should be given back their autonomy. Many in fact obeyed him, there were massacres throughout the cities, and some were driven into exile, the friends of Antipater were destroyed, and the governments, recovering the freedom of action that came with autonomy, began to form alliances with Polyperkin. Since the Megalopolitans alone held to their friendship with Cassander, Polyperkin decided to attack their city. When the Megalopolitans learned the intention of Polyperkin, they voted to bring all their property into the city from the country. On taking a census of citizens, foreigners, and slaves, they found that there were 15,000 men capable of performing military service. Some of these they at once attached to military formations, others they assigned to work gangs, and others they detailed to take care of the city wall. At one and the same time one group of men was digging a deep moat about the city, and another was bringing from the country timber for a palisade, some were repairing the weakened portions of the wall, while others were engaged in making weapons and in preparing engines for hurling bolts, and the whole city was deep in activity, owing both to the spirit of the population and to the danger that was foreseen. Indeed, word had spread abroad concerning the magnitude of the royal army and the multitude of the accompanying elephants, which were reputed to possess a fighting spirit and a momentum of body that were irresistible. When all had been hastily made ready, Polyperkin arrived with his entire army and took up his position near the city, building two camps, one for the Macedonians, the other for the Allies. Having constructed wooden towers higher than the walls, he brought them up to the city in those places that were convenient for the purpose, supplied them with missiles of many kinds and men to hurl these, and drove back those who were arrayed against him on the battlements. Meantime his sappers drove mines under the wall and then, by burning the mine props, caused the ruin of three very large towers and as many intervening sections of the wall. At this great and unexpected collapse the crowd of Macedonians shouted with joy, but those in the city were stunned by the seriousness of the event. Immediately the Macedonians began to pour through the breach into the city, while the Megalopolitans divided themselves, some of them opposing the enemy and, aided by the difficulty of the passage through the breach, putting up a stout fight, the rest cutting off the area inside the breach with a palisade and throwing up a second wall, applying themselves day and night without intermission to the task. 
since this work was soon finished owing to the multitude of workmen and the ample supply of all the needed material, the megalopolitans quickly made good the loss they had suffered by the breaching of the wall. Moreover, against those of the enemy who were fighting from the wooden towers they used bolt shooting catapults, slingers, and bowmen, and mortally wounded many. When many were falling or being disabled on each side and night had closed in about them, Polyperkin recalled his troops by a trumpet signal and returned to his own camp. On the next day he cleared the area of the breach, making it passable for the elephants, whose might he planned to use in capturing the city. The Megalopolitans, however, under the leadership of Damis, who had been in Asia with Alexander and knew by experience the nature and the use of these animals, got the better of him completely. Indeed, by pitting his native wit against the brute force of the elephants, Damis rendered their physical strength useless. He studded many great frames with sharp nails and buried them in shallow trenches, concealing the projecting points, over them he left a way into the city, placing none of the troops directly in the face of it, but posting on the flanks a great many javelin throwers, bowmen, and catapults. As Polly Perkin was clearing the debris from the whole extent of the breach and making an attack through it with all the elephants in a body, a most unexpected thing befell them. There being no resistance in front, the Indian Mahouts did their part in urging them to rush into the city altogether, but the animals, as they charged violently, encountered the spike-studded frames. Wounded in their feet by the spikes, their own weight causing the points to penetrate, they could neither go forward any farther nor turn back because it hurt them to move. At the same time some of the Mahouts were killed by the missiles of all kinds that poured upon them from the flanks, and others were disabled by wounds and so lost such use of the elephants as the situation permitted. The elephants, suffering great pain because of the cloud of missiles and the natures of the wounds caused by the spikes, wheeled about through their friends and trod down many of them. Finally the elephant that was the most valiant and formidable collapsed, of the rest, some became completely useless, and others brought death to many of their own side. After this piece of good fortune the Megalopolitans were more confident, but Polyperkin repented of the siege, and as he himself could not wait there for a long time, he left a part of the army for the siege, while he himself went off about other more necessary business. He sent Clytus the admiral out with the whole fleet, ordering him to lie in wait in the region of the Hellespont and block the forces that were being brought across from Asia into Europe. Clytus was also to pick up Aridaeus, who had fled with all his soldiers to the city of the Cianoi since he was an enemy of Antigonus. After Clytus had sailed to the Hellespont, had won the allegiance of the cities of the Propontis, and had received the army of Aridaeus, Nicanor, the commander of Munichia, reached that region, Cassander having sent him with his entire fleet. Nicanor had also taken over the ships of Antigonus so that he had in all more than a hundred. A naval battle took place not far from Byzantium in which Clytus was victorious, sinking seventeen ships of the enemy and capturing not less than forty together with their crews, but the rest escaped to the harbour of Chalcedon. After such a victory Clytus believed that the enemy would no longer dare fight at sea owing to the severity of their defeat, but Antigonus, after learning of the losses that the fleet had suffered, unexpectedly made good by his own keen wit and generalship the setback that he had encountered. Gathering auxiliary vessels from Byzantium by night, he employed them in transporting bowmen, slingers, and a sufficient number of other light-armed troops to the other shore. Before dawn they fell upon those who had disembarked from the ships of the enemy and were encamped on the land, spreading panic in the forces of Clytus. At once these were all thrown into a tumult of fear, and when they leaped into the ships, there was great confusion because of the baggage and the large number of prisoners. At this point Antigonus, who had made his warships ready and had placed in them as marines many of his bravest infantry, sent them into the fight, urging them to fall on the enemy with confidence, since the victory would depend entirely upon them. During the night Nicanor had put to sea, and, as dawn appeared, his men fell suddenly upon the confused enemy and at once put them to flight at the first attack, destroying some of the ships by ramming them with the beaks, sweeping off the oars of others, and gaining possession of certain of them without danger when they surrendered with their crews. They finally captured all the ships together with their crews save for the one that carried the commander. Clytus fled to the shore and abandoned his ship, endeavouring to make his way through Macedonia to safety, but he fell into the hands of certain soldiers of Lysimachus and was put to death. As for Antigonus, by inflicting so disastrous a blow upon the enemy, he gained a great reputation for military genius. He now set out to gain command of the sea and to place his control of Asia beyond dispute. 
For this end, he selected from his entire army 20,000 lightly equipped infantry and 4,000 cavalry and set out for Cilicia, hoping to destroy Eumenes before the latter should gather stronger forces. After Eumenes had news of Antigonus' move, he thought to recover for the king's Phoenicia, which had been unjustly occupied by Ptolemy, but being forestalled by events, he moved from Phoenicia and marched with his army through Coil Syria with the design of making contact with what are called the Upper Satrapies. Near the Tigris, however, the inhabitants fell on him by night, causing him the loss of some soldiers. Likewise in Babylonia when Seleucus attacked him near the Euphrates he was in danger of losing his whole army, for a canal was breached and his entire camp inundated, but by a piece of strategy of his own he escaped to a mound, diverted the canal to its old course, and saved himself and his army. Thus unexpectedly slipping through the hands of Seleucus, he went through into Persia with his army, which consisted of 15,000 infantry and 3,300 cavalry. After letting the army recover from its hardships, he sent word to the satraps and generals in the upper satrapies, requesting soldiers and money. And the affairs of Asia progressed to such a point during this year. In Europe, as Polyperkin had come to be regarded with contempt because of his failure at the siege of Megalopolis, most of the Greek cities deserted the kings and went over to Cassander. When the Athenians were unable to get rid of the garrison by the aid of either Polyperkin or Olympias, one of those citizens who were accepted leaders risked the statement in the assembly that it was for the advantage of the city to come to terms with Cassander. At first a clamor was raised, some opposing and some supporting his proposal, but when they had considered more carefully what was the expedient course, it was unanimously determined to send an embassy to Cassander and to arrange affairs with him as best they could. After several conferences peace was made on the following terms, the Athenians were to retain their city and territory, their revenues, their fleet, and everything else, and to be friends and allies of Cassander, Munichia was to remain temporarily under the control of Cassander until the war against the kings should be concluded, the government was to be in the hands of those possessing at least ten minae, and whatever single Athenian citizen Cassander should designate was to be overseer of the city. Demetrius of Phalerum was chosen, who, when he became overseer, ruled the city peacefully and with goodwill toward the citizens. Afterwards Nicanor sailed into the Piraeus with his fleet ornamented with the beaks of the ships taken at his victory. At first Cassander regarded him with great approval because of his success, but later, when he saw that he was filled with arrogance and puffed up, and that he was, moreover, garrisoning Munichia with his own men, he decided that he was planning treachery and had him assassinated. He also made a campaign into Macedonia, where he found many of the inhabitants coming over to him. The Greek cities, too, felt an impulse to join the alliance of Cassander, for Polyperkin seemed to lack both energy and wisdom in representing the kings and his allies, but Cassander, who treated all fairly and was active in carrying out his affairs, was winning many supporters of his leadership. Since Agathocles became tyrant of Syracuse in the following year, we shall bring this book to an end at this point as was proposed at the beginning. We shall begin the next book with the tyranny of Agathocles and include in it the events that deserve commemoration in our account. End of Book 18